Okay, so, uh, school committee meeting minutes of January 24th. I'll second. Oh, yeah. No, we're on Okay, I have, I have to accept that yet. Okay, any uh, discussion or edits? Changes? No, call for a vote. Call for favor. Aye. 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 Okay, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to start the superintendent's report tonight with um, pilots and recognitions. And so um, I just have a few um, since we haven't had a ton that's happened since the last time we met last week, but um, we have had a couple of exciting things to happen. Uh, first and foremost, I had a chance to attend the chorus and jazz ensembles first concert of the year um, last Wednesday evening, the Dolphin. Um, and it was a fantastic um, display of both of our musicians and, um, and our vocal talents. Um, the crowd was really moved by some of the pieces, um, and I think it was really entertaining. Um, I think the John Coltrane piece really uh, was uh, got people moving in their seats a little bit, and um, I think the uh, the band piece of the end seasons of love was great to cap it off and probably apropos for the time. So, um, but I was so moved by it that I reached out to the principals and to um, Jonathan Cade, who did a great job um, conducting that night and getting everyone ready, uh, and asked if they could um, do a reprise of the concert for the. Uh, elementary students and so we're in the process right now of putting together a mini field trip kind of in district uh, we'll bring our elementary students over to the Dolphins so that they have a chance to um, see the folks from the um, elementary chess perform um, and just taste of kind of what they have to look forward to um, as they move into um, elementary chess and some of the offerings that they have there um, so we're really excited uh, and then also just today we had um, were that three of our students have been recognized by the Scholastic Art Awards for artwork they submitted in December. The Scholastic Art Awards are one of the longest running and most prestigious art recognitions for teenagers in the United States. It's a huge honor. Um, and the three students from Linux that were recognized are Finn Jolly, who received a Silver Key Award for his mixed media self portrait. Um, this is an impressive feat, considering the fact that uh, Finn is a sophomore, so we still have. Um, quite a bit of time ahead of him to continue his work. Uh, Cece Carey also received an honorable mention for her incredibly creative and thought-provoking zine um, titled Limbo. And for those of you who are unaware, a zine is a self-published magazine um, of your self-produced artwork. Um, so uh, the judges were impressed by that performance as well. And then Julianne Harwood received an honorable mention for her mixed media work that combines photography with embroidery and represents different idioms. This work um, that she's creating as part of her AP portfolio, um, and she has to submit as part of her AP project. So, congratulations to the Finn, CC, and Julianne. And um, you'll be able to view the key awards in the near future. Um, once we have more information about where they'll be published, we'll share that with our social media elements. And so, that uh, concludes the highlights and recognitions. Uh, although, I would be remiss if I didn't just say um, that we are very thankful for our law enforcement partners who held the forum. Um, a couple of safety drills at both schools um, this past week, and it went great. So, uh, we're really thankful for their support, uh, both from Lennox PD and from Massachusetts State Police. Um, that said, we're going to move into um, the next phase of this report, report, which are presentations of budgets. Um, so, we've invited uh, Brenda Kelly, the principal of Morris, Kim Dion, the Special Education Director, um, and Ms. Falkowski, Chief uh, Operations and uh, Superintendent of Operations and Finance, to share their budget presentations um, with you this evening. Um, just so that we're all uh, aware of, kind of the format of the night, I asked them to prepare a very brief overview, focusing primarily on what's changed. Um, so, you know, what's new, um, where are there uh, either major cost increases or decreases, um, briefly share why that's the case. Uh, and then really be here for more of a dialogic um, opportunity to have a conversation with the school committee and uh, answer any questions that, um, that you may have for them. So uh, that's kind of the format. So they've each prepared uh, a very brief budget presentation um, and they'll be available for questions. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to invite Brenda Kelly, the principal of Morris, to share with us the budget presentation for her preliminary budget for Morris Elementary for fiscal year 24. Share Sure, 
just going to stop for that point here. Yeah. Just a minute, I'll we'll get our screen sharing enabled here so she can share Brenda's question. Yeah, get your uh, screen, get your question. Yeah, it's going to be a question. You know, Emma, what's that? No, I can do it. I just um, I wanted to find your email and I just did, so I can do it right now. Okay. Sorry for the delay. You want to view and come to the other PDF. Yeah. Will the PDF free PDF editor do it? This is doing that. Uh, no. Yeah. Then we'll go to the right. Over the right to that one. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't see that. Right there. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, Mark. <clears throat> you could just go to that second slide. Yeah. Well, there you go. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, present the 2022-2023 budget. First off, as always, I'd like to um, thank my staff for all their hard work and dedication over the past year, um, even last year. You know, we're still going through some changing times here um, as uh, the pandemic evolves. I just thought I'd uh, share some quotes from some of our fifth grade students about Morris. Um, we are um, just making sure that all of our needs are met. You can see Sam um, feels that all students belong, that all students feel, um, feel like they belong at Morris. Um, last year, we purchased, thanks to all of you, um, some um, opportunities for students for flexible seating. So what this student just made a comment on how the standing desk helps her stay focused during the day. Um, another student commented on how um, they feel very fortunate to have Shakespeare and Audubon Society come in each week. And um, we offer band lessons and uh, most important thing to me is the very last comment where it says Morris is taught me to be a kind person. So, um, you know, thank all of you and the staff for ensuring that our students are healthy, safe, and are ready to learn when they come to school. Okay, next slide, please. So the first slide you'll see is um, the building administration, which is the principal budget in kindergarten. There is just a slight increase here for supplies. Um, we really, over the past um, six to eight months, seen an increase in purchasing supplies just with the inflation. Um, a ream of paper is just outrageous right now. So if there's just a slight increase there and um, with contractual obligations um, amongst the teaching staff. Next slide, please. Um, again, the same thing is true with the art program and um, um, grades one through um, five with the supplies. There's just 
we've just seen such an increase um, in the cost of supplies. So we have increased the art budget from 1800 to 2000 just to accommodate for that. And then um, the Autobahn program is um, incorporated into our um, program as well. Next slide, please. Here is the instructional service um, slide um, where we have the fun field trips, um, assemblies. You will see um, an increase in a cost in curriculum. Um, that is for our literacy footprints. We um, are reading program. We are making sure that all the, the teachers have um, the available um, books um, for the instructional needs of um, the students. Um, I also just want to say we're looking into a science program for the 2023-2024 um, budget. We are going to be piloting next year. Um, so there's some curriculum development and professional development that we will be doing um, the next school year. Um, right now, uh, Morris does not have a science program, so we're really not cohesive. Um, across the grade level. So we're looking at building that cohesiveness amongst um, the grade levels um, and the students. Next slide, please. Um, instructional technology and music are really slight increases. Um, instructional technology, um, uh, Ms. Olander is also our Canvas facilitator and champion. And um, the slight increase there, again, is due to her contractual obligation. Next slide, please. Um, in library, um, I'm looking to purchase a more diverse um, selection of books for our students. Um, uh, our librarian is new this year. And over the past year and a half, she has really gone through um, the books that are at Morris. And we really are in need of um, some new selections for students. And uh, we are looking at, um, as I said, increasing our diverse selection. And in our guidance um, section of the budget, um, I have requested that our guidance counselor um, increase from um, a 0 0.80 to a 1 FTE. Um, that increase will be coming from um, the ESSER funding, um, but that is to support the um, social emotional needs um, within Morse um, right now. And besides that, there's no other increases. And then other student activities, we have um, added an additional um, club to our after school um, or before school programming choice, which is a math club. We have piloted it this year. It is going very well. So that is the increase you will see in um, other student activities. And in health service, there's no um, increases um, except for a contractual obligation. Next slide, please. And here you will see that um, the majority of the Morris budget is um, given to the instructional needs of the students a small portion um, for administration guidance and pupil services. Next slide. Um, and again, our variance is just over 3%, 3.13% um, for the next school year. And then I just um, wasn't sure if anyone had any questions for me. And I just also have to say that the students um, and the staff at Morris are very grateful for Teddy. So thank you so much for approving um, the comfort dog. He has certainly made a difference in his short two weeks at Morris. Any questions? Well, I did have a question, but yes, um, you know, we have a bunch of documents that we have. We also have the entire spreadsheet. Sure. For the yep. you know, so I'm kind of trying to look at things simultaneously here. And Melissa, um, maybe you could just for it's not going to show on the screen, but maybe you could just kind of for the school for me's sake and anybody who might have access to this document, kind of go over the columns in the spreadsheet on any particular given page and know what we're looking at. Are you talking about the complete budget spreadsheet? Well, it it, it 
Um, we just go to that for a second and see if that's. <clears throat> there are no other increases like in PE or the other tabs that you might be seeing besides contractual obligations. I just went through the, the highlights. The highlights yeah. of what I requested. Yeah. Well, my question was, and Melissa, I, I was just thinking of one of just any page of the of the elementary budget or or you know just the ones that has like 10 columns or 12 columns or whatever. Um, so there's two different types. There's just the spreadsheet, and then there's also the PDF that I put together that broke it out by um, each school and their five-year averages. Is that the one you're looking at? No, I was with uh, well. Yeah, I mean, there is a five year average column. Okay. Yep. So just give me one second. Let me pull that up. But while she's, while she's pointing that out, um, Brendan, my question was the library book total seems like a very, very low number to the average for five years was over 3,000. And you, I know you didn't have much last year because kids weren't in school. Um, and so you're going up to 1,000, 250, 1,000, but um, that's about 40 books. Well, if you see, well, one I want to say um, our um, PTL, which is phenomenal. Um, we had our book fair this year, and they have donated some books to the library, so we were able to purchase some books through the PTO. I also want to say, I think when Melissa will go, th when you will see going through that five-year average, that there was not even any purchases for the library during that time. So we are. Um, as I said, going through our library um, books right now, and um, $750 worth of books will give us quite a few um, books um, that we will be able to purchase for the in, for the upcoming year. Okay, good, good, thank you. I don't know if anybody asked this question, but Melissa, why don't you go through and just talk briefly about the, the columns and the um, <clears throat> Uh, are we going to be going through the budget book? Is that our intention? Uh, uh, as you, I mean, we usually go through. I mean, I've got annotated questions on, yeah. on a number of sections. So I right. just want to understand well, the procedure. Yeah, and that's yeah, right. that's yeah, that's you know, Brent just made her presentation, and now it's, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. And I apologize, I was late. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. If you have questions on a specific section, that's why I want to um, you know have Melissa kind of just highlight the. Spreadsheet for us. Sorry, I have difficulty in Google, so please bear with me. I can pull it's it my up. own. It's my own fault. <laughs> Mr. Riddler, do you have any questions for me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. No, they're just they're just files. Yeah, things that that yeah. yeah. here. Oh, yeah. I have my yeah. 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 Thank you. Do you want to ask me then? Yeah, I'll get to it. I mean, I don't know. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, I mean, that's okay. So, the, the complete budget booklet is broken out by each building or program area. So, um, Brenda just gave you the overview of Morris. And when you get into the actual budget document, which is shared on the drive, um, it's got the program strengths highlighted and all of that that Brenda did go over. But we also have under each program, um, for instance, on page eight, where we start with administration, um, we've detailed the 21 budget, 21 actual expenditures, five year average of non salary expenditures. We thought that was important this year because we had a few blips in our history from um, the pandemic. So we went back five years to 17 to um, prior to the pandemic um, and plugged in those numbers so that you would see what was actually spent during a uh, somewhat normal school year. So 17 to 21. Yes, or, or it was 15, whatever the five year period yep. for 15 to 19. Um, so those numbers are in there for reference so that you can see the average dollars spent on that line item. Um, the 22 final budget is what was uh, final, approved finally. The year-to-date expenditures is through um, when we gave this to you, so probably about three, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. 
we plugged in those numbers. And this year we added a few new columns, full-time equivalent FTE for 2022 and FTEs for 2023, so that you can see if there were any changes in personnel in each area within the um, schools. Um, and then we have our initial budget, which is um, over to the right. That's our preliminary request, the variance to fiscal year 22, and then anything that we could note that would give you more insight as to why things were increasing or decreasing. We put notes over to the right under description of services. Yeah, and Brenda gave us four, four specifics under each yes. program. So that's that yes. helpful. Okay, thanks. So now uh, open up to anybody who wants to ask about any section of the elementary budget. And I don't know if you guys if we want to go through section by section, or just want to ask, go ahead. I can say, I mean, I've got a question I'll deal with you. Um, and, you know, I, I was just um, kind of curious, uh, you know, thoughts the other because I read this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, in, in, in two instances here, in, in the overview, you reference, uh, uh, in one instance, you, you know, you reference MCAS data uh, indicating the need uh, for science program. Yes, which you have highlighted. I, yeah. I, I was kind of curious about that. And then I wondered in some way um, if, if MCAS in any way was indicative of um, uh, a move towards purchasing with framing your thoughts. Or I don't know if they're related, but it's. Right. So framing your thoughts was purchased before I became principal at Morris Elementary School. And I do know that before the shutdown in March of, um, what's that, 2019? 20. 20. Um, they were looking at also a writing program. So Framing Your Thoughts is more of a grammatical, structural program for teaching students how to write. Um, we are still in the process of going through and looking for um, a writing program for Morris. Um, the MCAS science, we have seen, I can just say from what I've seen through the MCAS data and through my observations at Morris Elementary School in the past year and a half, is our science program or the science that we are using is, is not as cohesive as it could be if we purchased a science um, program. Um, so I wouldn't say that our MCAS data is... It, you know, not where we would like it to be, but I feel like we could do better if we had a cohesive program that built upon each other from year to year. Is there a, a reason why there hasn't been a science curriculum? I gotta say, I can't, I, that was before my time. I just know what I know coming in this last year and a half, sorry. <coughs> I have a couple questions. Um, yes, actually, really just one. And so, in the chart that talks about the grade 25, lost out of it. Yep. To the right, it says two new staff in 2022, and they're instructional in your notation on the right. And then it says one new ant period for 2023. And I'm just assuming we're not hiring aunts, so I'm just mm -hmm. curious what the ant is for. So are we in this? Are we in the you go, oh, anticipated. anticipated. I tried. I was like, ancillary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have this budget contemplates two new staff being added and then one potential. We're just not sure how that's going to play out. Okay. And um, that's under the instructional. So the teacher numbers are the same. Is yes. that support instructional or what are we looking at? So the two, I can explain. Yeah. Um, the two new staff were hired in this year. So there were savings in the salary line in, I think it's grades one through five you're looking at right now. Yeah. yeah. So there was savings in the salary line. So when I wrote two new staff, we're not looking to hire two new staff. We did hire two new staff, replace staff that left. Okay. Either retired or left, resigned. Okay. So we have new people in place this year that are going to continue. Okay. Um, 
I think that explains it a little bit better. Yeah, explains but, but there was a budget item for the staff. So when we're looking at the five year average, at least the placeholder, whether it's the actual person or not, that those staff members were part of the budget. The five year average did not apply to salaries, but okay. we do see last year's salaries in there. Okay, gotcha. All right. Just was really just maybe like, I don't know what this means. So, thank you. One other question to, to clarify from your presentation, but for, for health, the health services increase, um, I'm just trying to make sure I understand, is that coming about because the portion of the cost that was covered by ESSER is no longer going to be covered by ESSER, and so we are therefore yes. responsible for it? Yes. And there is um, there there is a chance that there will be a column on Column movement in that position, um, either this year or the next. So that is, um, there is a portion of that for that as well. Yeah, so yeah. I, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was, I was going to move on to uh, just a question on administration. Um, you, you talked about. Um, in increasing, uh, one of the concerns and challenges you, you talked about it is an ever increasing amount of paperwork for virtually every aspect of of of, 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 of your, like your work, um, and and you know, and, and as you say, that pulls you away from you know your, your primary function. And I wondered if um, thought has been given to any way to mitigate that paperwork uh, or, or mitigate the uh, you know the time you allot to those to to that paperwork. Is there a way to have to minimize that impact so that you can really do what you're what you're charged? So. Uh... I do do what I'm hired to do. It's called. Um, Don't take that. But that no, was it's okay. It's called uh, the, week, the weekend. It in, bad no, it's okay. Bad. It's called the weekend in early mornings. It's fine. It, it is the nature of the job. Um, and I have to say, um, dealing with the pandemic has increased the amount of paperwork. Um, but I can say when we go on before we leave for February break, I will have. Um, observed all of my instructional staff and support staff at least once they will all have their formative evaluations um so i you know i live and breathe this job i, I love it and the students are my children i have two grown adults and they're off on their own so um you don't need to worry. I'm, I'm, I'm giving I'm not 100%. Worried. It's okay. It, it, it is what it is. It is the nature of the job. And you just learn to become organized and very um, proficient at the things that you need to do. Now, how do you interject to, I would say that, you know, in terms of paperwork and managing workflows, um, Brenda has just this year alone uh, introduced a new innovation at Morris, uh, where she's built a dashboard, which is a shared Google spreadsheet that literally links out to every possible thing that you need in order to, you know, run that school and share information back with the teacher. So I think that's been one way where she's tried to reduce the amount of paperwork uh, and, and using Google to share back and forth rather um, than, you know, sending copies back and forth and that kind of thing. So I think that's optimized the workflow a bit, but definitely um, the, the COVID, the pool testing, that kind of stuff takes a lot of legwork, uh, contact tracing, you know, so those are the things. And then obviously um, doing the observations of teachers and the paperwork involved with that. So um, I think there is places to optimize it by sharing. I think that a new student information system is also going to help, you know, alleviate some of the paperwork uh, as we move forward. Uh, and as we grow in our use of Google, uh, you know, that'll help. But, you know, there is still some, you know, Brutal paperwork that is just part of being a principal. Uh, you know, I've been, I think Brent has been very savvy trying to find ways to do that. I think that that sharing that document with our staff has been a, a game changer for um, helping to facilitate a lot of that. And I'll just add that, like, our that's, and that's why people see that they're not in the buildings and they don't know our schools intimately. 
we've been pretty lean, and there's not a lot of assistance and extras. And when you have a, an executive support person who you know is vital because of everything you have to deal with, but my understanding is even most of the front office people are in many functions as far as how they're assisting students. And so I just want to commend you for that. Appreciate that. It's it's not a place where there's a lot of Everybody's doing double duty on a lot of different things in most of the building, from my yes. experience. Yeah. Has it been quite some time since we've had a guidance counselor who is five days a week at Morris? I'm, honestly, I don't think so. I don't think there's ever been somebody there that's been yeah. consistent. We, my experience is never. We did not. You know, I heard the first one. It was like a three day a week thing years and years ago, and then it grew to be, it grew to be more, maybe point eight or something. but. Like this is the first year this full time. Like Another, next year. Next year. And the nature of what a guidance counselor is has changed remarkably over time. So you know, historically a guidance counselor literally counseled children, right? Um, but now they write um, 504 plans and oversee that process, um, which is kind of like the medical um, cousin to an IEP and an individualized education plan. So they work on those. They are still doing, you know, the, the counseling with the kids. They're also working with staff and supporting them. Um, so the overall scope of, of the, the position has changed. And they're also doing student groups. They go into classrooms to social lessons. And so, uh, you know, it's really grown in, in the scope of what guidance counselor does over time. Yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, we all know there's a giant crisis with mental health with um, kiddos right now. So. And that was actually started even before COVID. So all of the educational, uh, you know, magazines and books before COVID were talking about some mental health crises and depression and, um, you know, the wrestling with the schools. And so that was all pre-COVID. And then COVID really only exacerbated that condition for us. So um, it's not just because of COVID, but it's something that was true long before COVID. I just had one little thing about that, it, 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 and just echoing a little bit, but building on what um, Megan said is that what I noticed in your description that's really helpful too about really kind of a job description for each of these positions or departments is the way in which you talk about behavioral man, like behavioral coaching and bringing parents and families in, and that's not service that's very easy to get even if you have resources. It's very hard to find somebody who they can do you know mental health counseling or family counseling, but what are some of the coaching about how to help kids transition? And mine are out of it, but I definitely remember when my first one was in elementary school being a little overwhelmed and having, a, there was a class that we did that we met in the evenings, it was facilitated by, um, by Donna, and it was really great. I mean, really having parents say, you know, here's some coaching we can do around helping you. It makes you feel like it's a team, I think it connects. And it really, people say, oh, get that outside of school. It's, it's really, really, really hard to get. And even if you have resources, and for families that struggle with those types of resources, it's just really hard to not people doing that. So in any way that we're helping with that, I think it's great because you know, we're all just trying to figure things out. Yeah, that's not their role, right? Now the places a social worker may play that role, so they also kind of take on that little piece as well. Um, yeah, I, I, you, you brought something up in the art section. Yes, that um, that was. Um, uh, that, that when I after I read it a couple of times, it, it kind of seemed very. Uh, I, I tried to look at it from a student's point of view, and and, and that's where it talks about um, the demand to create learning opportunities for math and ELA, um, you know, and other subjects in in a, in a, in a significant way where uh, it, it seems that um, you know students are asked to write about artwork. Students are asked to critique about artwork. And, and, I, and I think of, and I, I've tried to put myself in a, and it's also as well and good, but I'm trying to put myself in the, in the place of student. And, and, and especially where they're, they're now in an art class, but they're needing to, they're, they're not in a writing class. So they're not in a, they're, in, they're, they're not in a, uh, an analysis class. And, and I'm wondering, um, you know, we don't do the same thing in music. Like, I didn't see this type of analysis in music. Music is highly map oriented and certainly offers opportunities for critiquing. And I, I, I'm just wondering if this is, if, if someone's struggling in, 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 in writing and yet here they are in art, 
you know, what support perhaps exists for that student who doesn't write well and is now thinks they're in art, but all of a sudden, like they're not getting a break. Right. So our art valid? Is that valid? Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Okay. Our art teacher um, does a fantastic job of collaborating with the grade level teachers. And um, so it is not the focus is not writing, but sometimes the, the students will reflect upon each other's art and, and it's if they need help and it's right there for their assistance. Um, the fantastic thing about Morris um, is we have a lot of interventionists and support to help the students. And if the student needs support, we're right there to um, help them. But as I said, the art class is for art. And right. if a student isn't able to do that, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, it would, it would be kind of silly right. to have to have a writing intervention right. for a student in an art class. Right, right. That, that, uh, art is for art. I can tell you, though, um, right before we take the MCAS test, the art teacher will certainly help us out with our geometry right. and go over, you know, the, the shapes and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. No, I, I mean, that's a good point, but... In, to your point, I mean, we definitely have, you know, in all the programs, even more academic than ever have been through, you know, standardization and the role of the Common Core. And, you know, there are tests where you'll see all these items where kids are asked to look at two different pictures and then write about them and the parents are asked. So, um, you know, this is something that is sometimes asked of them on these tests. So um, sometimes that forces our hand more so than we would want, right? Um, and but we do make plenty of time for creative expression to require as well. Um, I think you definitely see that at Morris, definitely um, at a very high degree in the second level. Well, Brenda, this is kind of just a general question. You've obviously built a, a very tight budget overall. I think as far as I can tell, the only thing you're really adding is the, the literacy curriculum element. Um, what what would be on your wish list? Either you mentioned science, you know, science for till longer term, but I mean, if you had another hundred thousand dollars, what are the things that Morris could be doing? We'd we'd ideally be thinking about. Well, we would certainly um, invest in, in in more student literature for the students. Um, there are certain materials that we could purchase that need just. With the, with the pandemic, um, we sent a lot of materials home. And then, especially for our early literacy um, foundations, requires those magnetic boards and those um, manipulatives, um, just being able to um, refurbish some of the materials that might have been lost due to no fault of anyone's. Um, you know, we could have whiteboards in every classroom um, expand our flexible seating. I, I mean, the list could go on and on. I could certainly um, spend that money. <laughs> but it sounds like it's mostly it's mostly stuff in a sense that that the buildings need. There's a lot of things that we could do differently um, to help engage some of the students um, instead of just you know sitting at a desk, you know, flexible seating. Um, there are several classrooms where they're sitting on yoga balls and things like that, or even just for like refurbishing or getting whiteboards that wear the projector, things like that. Um, some of our technology could use some updating, just like where the projectors are, having the teacher being able to move about the room and not stuck in one spot, all those types of things. Yeah, um, can also think of some of the science, technology, engineering, and math enhancements too, that maybe like a major space or enhanced opportunities for inquiry learning and some engineering uh, curriculum, which, you know, again, I think we're probably underdeveloped right now at the elementary level and some of those things in relation to maybe some care districts around the state. Is any of that potentially capital or would that all to be regular So the furniture could be capital, it would be included in capital. Um, the flexible seating, definitely. Um, the what was the other item? The whiteboards. Whiteboard. The whiteboards. Yeah, that would fall under capital and technology. We do set aside a certain amount for technology. Yeah. We would just need to, you know, parse it out to their needs in that area. The ESSER grant um, does have a new one. We did put technology in that as well, so we have some room to do that stuff. 
I just want to point out that um, we are in need of a science program, uh, but we really need to go through a process. You know, if, if funding came available, I, I'm not a proponent of, okay, let's just purchase the first thing out there. We really need to vet a program, and that's really what next year is going to do. Um, so I, I just want to make that um, statement. Thank you for saying that because you know the opposite of that is the ready fire aim approach, and you know that really uh, I think is the worst way to talk for people. So I'm glad you're thinking about this in a very systematic fashion. And the other thing I'm hopeful for, or I support anyway, obviously I'm just one, but is the opportunity to peer to peer engage. So when you have your teacher teams, your leader teams, that they actually be able to attend conferences and work through some of this. I think often we kind of just I don't want to say derived or like throw things, but we put teachers in and we said they do this, but just experience so much growth around collaboratively learning, getting ideas on how to use something. So maybe when we do that, hopefully there's some opportunity to think about whether it's bringing training in, but even better, getting secure here, um, somebody within the region that's doing it and they can, they can do some learning. I think I know that there's always oftentimes a summer to do for that, but teachers are willing to do it. And I think it's great that they have that chance to collaborate and have a here and work on those things. I don't know if that will be available, but I, I think that's great. And we can include that. So, a couple of structural questions. Just I noticed that there's the kindergarten budget, and then art seems to have kindergarten in it, Biz Ed has kindergarten in it, as well as you know, K through five, basically. Right? So, is it art, Biz Ed? And music that's K through five. So, are you talking about the specialists for what we have for specialists? We have so kindergarten through fifth grade, all students for specialists have music, art, gym, PE, and um, technology. Um, we also have um, Spanish which is a half an hour a week through kindergarten through our so the teachers have professional learning time together they, it's where they they get together and we work on things um, this year we had a focus on literacy footprints and small group instruction during the, that time so is did that answer your question and then there's maybe. library time okay. built into that plt time maybe it's just in your program what would you to call the k-5 physical program and R is a K through five program. Actually, pre K through fifth grade. Well, that was my next question. Yes. I didn't see any mention of pre K at all. So pre K does go to um, PE. Okay. okay. Well, pre K falls, falls under my department. Okay. One thing at a time. So, <laughs> so, so the kindergarten portion of the budget doesn't include the costs for. Is that or no? That's all in the one through five budget. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So while the phys ed is in the phys ed budget, the library is in the library department budget. Grades one through five do not include those expenses. That's uh, okay. 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 Oh, yeah. Thank you. Nice. No, all right. Okay. Any other questions for Brett? And pre K is under. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I think that's a natural segue then into the student service budget. Um, so we'll invite um, Kim Dion to present that, and I will share my screen um, so we have an opportunity for the viewers at home to see the presentation as well. Just give me one moment while I share. While he's doing that, thank you for allowing me to present. I know you have some questions about budget, so. Hopefully, I can answer them. So, student services is not only special education, but it's also 504 um, EL and pre K falls under my department. And EL stands for English Learners. Yeah, correct. So, just a little bit of brief, brief background. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but Again, it just details every um, department that I oversee. So in the administration line, that's myself and my um, admin assistant. You'll see an increase in PD conference travel and in service 
Um, I'm anticipating that a lot of the PD is going to be going back to in person. Therefore, the cost is going to go up. Need a room. Let's increase our PD um, costs. So, for example, I belong to the administrators of special education for Massachusetts. So we meet with um, Russell Johnson, who is, um, I believe, his title is assistant commissioner um, for special education. So we meet with him. Well, we've been meeting monthly with him um, over Zoom. I'm anticipating we'll be meeting with him um, in person, hopefully next year. Um, a lot of like most of the PDs are, like I said, Zoom. So that's why that uh, that line item has increased. Uh, supplies has increased again. Copy paper. Uh, we have a color code system for our uh, some of our folders. It's just easier to manage. It's actually um, when I came into this position, that's the system that they added. It's actually easier um, for this color coded system. And then postage. We actually decreased last year. We increased the budget this year. We decreased it. And last year we had increased it because um, more things were being mailed out to new families. Uh, our instructional, again, we're talking about contractual obligations for salaries. Um, we have salary increases for our related service providers, contractual obligations. So we contract for our OT and PT services, and we actually contract with the BCBA also. And those services have um, historically increased. Maybe you can explain what a BCBA is. So our BCBA is our behavioral consult. Um, it's a board certified behavioral uh, analyst. And so they were familiar with children on the autism spectrum um, who need very direct instruction. Um, they need to do uh, what we call discrete trials where they learn a skill, they get an immediate reward. And so um, it's this, you know, error-proof teaching. So it's a, a high degree of training that they need to be qualified to do that work. And so we've also had a salary increase in the amount of, of support that we need. We've uh, had two additional positions due to needs. Again, all of these are based on students' IEP and the services that we are uh, that we provide. Um, there's also been again a PD increase. Um, I increased that again. I, um, you know, I'm seeing that more and more people will probably be going in person. Um, we've had a professional um, instructional supplies and textbooks. Um, along with that PD increase, sorry, there's prof uh, professional publications increase. So those are some of the resources that the staff um, need. We have um, a couple of programs that staff have requested that are helping our children and that substantially that increase that subscription has increased. Um, and the instructional um, supplies again, those are just um, <coughs> line items that staff um, are requesting. Those are some consumables that we use um, for testing protocols for our school psychologist um, that we need. So this is our other district costs. So these are um, for our students who are placed out of district. Um, Lennox is not able to provide the services for um, these students. So we, um, we have less than 0.5% of our students that are out of district. Um, this also includes our students who are in the 18 to 22 program. And we will be contracting with BARC, BCARC, to provide job coaching for some of our students. Um, they will also be um, um, any day programs that our students may attend. So again, transportation is huge. That is, you know, a, a big portion of this increase is the cost of tra uh, transportation. We only have two schools in this area um, that really that our students can go to for out of district. So it's been, um, the out of district schools aren't suitable for students here. They would have to go further out towards where I live in, in um, Tampa County or other counties. So the transportation cost is huge. 
and then tuition increases. So DESE sets the rates for tuition for out-of-district schools. Those typically do not come out until September or October, um, so that we will not see what the rate increases till September or October um, this year, 22. Sorry. Um, so I, I just estimate 5% because I don't know what they're going to be. They can range anywhere between 3% to a 5% increase. And that those are set by DESE. And those don't include sometimes, they don't include, um, for example, one school will have it for like 216 days. That's what the tuitions cost. So that is including summer programming. Some schools don't list the summer programming. So we then have to pay additional if, they, if the team feels that the student needs extended school year services. And it doesn't include OTPT or speech services. So then we have to then pay their contracted rate of what they pay for an OTPT or um, speech. So you'll see um, that our budget is up by 6.94%. Um, but that, that's a lot of it is due to the out of districts, the transportation, and the tuition costs. Other school services. So, this is the 504s uh, department that I oversee. Um, we had to, we had a support salary, so we had the need to um, add support for a student. And I believe that was just a line item move. Mm -hmm. So that's why you'll see the huge increase to point uh, plus 218%. So we had to actually switch, um, I, I believe it was from the Morris budget, we moved it over into the 504. Yeah, that was just an accounting cleanup, mm -hmm. but just putting it yeah. into the right spot. Mm -hmm. And again, um, professional publication supply increases. So these are areas. Um, as far as like the PD needs. So I need, as the 504 district coordinator, um, I need to attend trainings, the 504 the guidance, um, our student adjustment counselor at um, Morris and our guidance counselor at LMMHS attend the train some of the trainings along with me. Um, I just actually signed up for a training um, in June and the cost is up close to $800. So um, that's something that I, I am required to um, attend in order to then uh, train the staff. And then it's just a slight increase in supplies again. And then our other school services, um, the ELL services. So we have two licensed ESL teachers. Um, we, have, we currently now have 21 students um, whose primary native language is not English. Um, again, contractual ob um, obligations, tutoring. That was um, the ESSER grant is moved to ESSER in 2022. Uh, PD travel, again, I'm anticipating that there may be more in person. And then um, I know that one of the ESL teachers has asked for a curriculum for, I believe, grades three and four, so that will, um, you'll see the increase there. Um, that's an actual decrease in the temp and instructional supplies. So we actually have a decrease. Now, the, the good thing about the EOL services is that we do have a Title III grant um, that we contract with uh, the collaborative in Northampton who runs, basically runs the grant for us. Um, they get a small percentage of the grant, and it's it's about 2300 2700 I believe. Um, and so we have to pay for the PD, the textbooks, and then once we get them in, once um, once we actually spend the money, we can then get reimbursed for it. So, but again, these are certain things that you know it, it may only we may only be able to get three hundred dollars back reimbursed, or maybe only two hundred. So that they allocate certain percentages in this grant on what we can spend. So I can attend, a, um, you know, PD or the teachers. Um, Brenda can attend a PD, and we can get reimbursed for some of that. So you're going to see that 
those um, allocations, but some of that will come back to us once we've spent the money. And also, <clears throat> the 21 students that uh, Kim referenced, two of those um, are new to the district and they are coming to us on tuition agreements with Army and Rivers, so we'll actually get revenue um, to offset the cost of educating those two. Uh, And so then it's just uh, for other school services, you'll see the EL services are at 86%, 504 is at 14%. Other school services, again, it's at 16.65, but remember the 504, we had that line change. Anybody has any questions? Any questions for Ms. Dion? I just oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I just I guess it's a broad question, but the I mean the overall spending on food services obviously going up fairly quickly last year and again this year, sort of the seven percent range. Um, and I, I guess I'm concerned that it's crowding out other places we could be spending. Uh, you know, we're, we are increasing our uh, special education budget, I think, more than we're increasing either the Morris or LMHX. Uh, and so I guess I understand that some of these are just mandated costs that we don't have any control over, but there are also a lot of costs that we do have control over. And so I guess I sort of want to get your thoughts. If, if we wanted to keep growth in special education funding more in line with growth elsewhere, um, where would be the places that we have some flexibility in how much of our resources we allocate here? Quite honestly, I don't see any um, because, as you know, we are mandated um, to provide services for our students with disabilities. Um, we have to make sure that they're given a free and appropriate public education. Um, <clears throat> so as a team, when we're meeting as a team, um, we have to decide what services are appropriate for, for our students. And Lennox is lucky um, in that, I would say, um, oh, I actually have some of the figures here from the state, um, that our, our, our department has that approximately 74% of our students are in full inclusion, which is, is, is what we want. And then in order to do that, um, the team recognizes what services are needed and we provide the support for our students so that they can get those services. Um, we have students who have come in as move-ins, school choice. Um, so districts that they come from write IEPs and we have to follow those until we, we have a meeting. And quite honestly, with those um, students, I haven't seen where the services that were in other plans coming into ours where they were not appropriate. So, you know, our, our team looks at everything, we collect data to see what types of services. So these are services that we are, you know, we are mandated to, um, or we're obligated to provide. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, our out of districts, that's where you're going to see a lot of a lot of the expenditures. Yeah, no, yeah, that, that certainly makes up. And, out of and a lot of, you know, I mean, could I do without, you know, a couple of hundred dollars for supplies? I mean, you know, we have our 240 grant, we have our 262 grant, and out of, let me just share something with you, just because I wrote it down. Um, so... Our 240 grant this year, we got to around 251,000, of which about 12,000, close to 13,000, um, was taken out for what they call proportionate share. So, for any private school or homeschool students, we have to allocate a portion of, of our grant for those services for um, any, any child that attends Montessori or any homeschool student. So even if we have a student who lives in the Lee, but goes to a private school here, because um, they get federal funds, we have to then support them. So 
you're looking at you know two hundred fifty one thousand dollars, and then subtract thirteen from that, and then that's that's what we're allocated. Yeah. No, and and I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to suggest we sort of needed to look at that two hundred dollar supply categories. I'm looking at the you know one point seven million for our in house personnel, which I guess is going from about thirty three to thirty five FTEs this year. And so I guess what I'd be wondering is, you know, of the 35 FTEs, how many of those are mandated by IEPs? Well, again, it's about, it's, it's about the services. So what are we providing? What are we providing for services? Um, quite, you know, if, if you look at, if you look at um, my, my portion here, I would love to have an actual an additional teacher at the middle school so that we can have we can have a teacher for sixth seventh and eighth grade and we can actually co-teach with <coughs> or or you know one sixth grade um special ed teacher for sixth grade one special ed because now we have two and it and it's really hard um i think to divide those two teachers up between the three grade levels so if anything i mean you'll see where I have, you know, my long range goals are, are to do that. Um, we, you know, we have two pre K students, so that's in the in there too. I mean, two great pay teachers are, um, and some of our our teachers. We have four teachers who are considered team leaders, who run the IEP meetings, the initials, and and uh, the three years. But they do a lot of the paperwork. They'll check the IEPs. They do the invites. So that takes them away from classroom mm -hmm. instruction. Um, again, that's another thing that I would love to see in the future is to have one one person for the whole district, so that it brings those teachers back into the classrooms to provide the support for those kids, those students. And so, so just last question is: so there is this increase of two positions. If we didn't add two new positions, if we still were at about 33 FTEs in the coming year, would we be able to fulfill all of our legal commitments? No, those two, the two full-time that you're talking that we increased? Yes. Right, so those were support, those were our paraprofessionals, and, and those were based on the needs of the student. But do we have existing paraprofessionals in the system who could meet those needs? No. So we, okay. So the, those those two students um, have come from have either come from another district as a move in, um, and um, just based on their without getting into any oh, details. Yes. Okay. Is there any opportunity to look at uh, district placements, and do you have enough? Kids with similar needs, it would make sense to maybe have an in house program. Um, right. like low incidence kids or something like that. Right. So, so that's always that's always on the minds of special ed directors um, is to create in house programs. When you only have one or two students, it's hard to create a cohort because then you have to start thinking about the transitions. Um, I definitely see the possibility of creating something. Well, um, right now, the answer would be no because of, of the age span. Um, so one of the other things that you have to think about is the age span. So um, the Department of Ed will come in when they come into the tier focus monitoring this uh, in a couple of weeks, is that they look at your age span. So you can't have a group of um, special ed students in a self-contained room with more than uh, four years of an age span. Otherwise, you have to file for a waiver. So that's another thing that you have to look at. But yes, it, it would be, and that's something um, that we are trying to work with other districts on. And we do, we actually have, one of our students is actually tuitioned to um, another area of school district. So that that is great, but a lot of the districts are full. You know, their, their programs are full. Um, but I am in talks, I, I belong to a um, group of the Berkshire of special ed directors and we're always in talks about do you have any openings um, we did have a student who tuitioned in for our 18 to 22 year old program um, we just hired a new transition program teacher this year 
Um, she's doing an amazing job. Um, and I'm actually looking to have her create a program. So yes, maybe we can start tuitioning in some students, but it's going to take a little bit um, because transition, um, again, is, you know, we have our students, we can have them till the age of 22. So um, she's working, she'll be working with um, the middle school and helping the students because once they turn 14, we have to start thinking about transition. So she's going to be working with that. So yes, it's definitely something that we'd like to look at. Um, but with one or two, I don't know if that is very, very productive, seeing that then you, as you move along. Can I pick up on that for a second? I wanted to, that was, about, that was sort of lower down my list to, to, to comment on. Um, uh, and it, it, it sort of tied into perhaps high transportation costs and, and, and your comment in your, in your presentation earlier regarding perhaps some of the nearest places being Springfield and, 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 uh, and past the I-91 corridor. Uh, it just makes me think of um, other, and, and you had mentioned other districts and being in touch with other special ed directors. It just makes me think in, in, along the lines of, um, you know, we've got our kids here, we, we've got other districts that must be in a similar situation. And, and it makes me think of, of, is there, you know, any way to put together a cooperative so that we can offer a sort of a, uh, and, and maybe it can't be across the board, I, I don't know, age-wise, because I'm, I'm kind of sick of those challenges. Um, however, um, you know, something along the line of, of, of a therapeutic program for these kids who we identify earlier to help even mitigate some of those transportation stresses. Yes, yes. I mean, I know that like um, Pittsfield, for example, does have some programs. However, when I reached out to them, they were full <laughs> and they didn't have any, any openings. Um, you know, and, and something that I forgot to mention is that <laughs> we, we were hoping that we could have a bus driver slash van driver to you know transport some of our students and maybe look at that, but we have not been successful with finding a van or a bus driver. So that's another reason why some of our costs have gone up. Um, so just a plug out there, if anybody's interested in getting their CDL or their class 70, I did actually, which is so you know, in case we did have a driver and there ever was an emergency, feel free to contact me or Melissa and We'll, we'll get you going, because um, that, that's huge. That, like you said, that's yeah, huge. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm thinking of it in a different way, though. I, I, I'm thinking of it as the districts feed into mm -hmm. a, a, a unique place. Like perhaps. a collaborative, like almost like a collaborative. Yeah, collaborative. Yes. That would probably be the right mm -hmm. term. Um, where we're not looking for place, you know, space, but we're saying, you know, hey, Southern Cap, what, you know, wherever. Where, you know, can, what, what can we create? Mm -hmm. to um yeah. no it, it, and it's true because it's definitely um there the resources out here are not as great as they are you know where i live right in chicopee so in that area um but even even something and it's not simple but even something like the college community Right, and I always get this acronym because it changed, and so I remember it as ICE. So it's inclusive con concurrent en enrollment. So we had students at HCC, we had students at um, UMass, Westfield State. They have a great program, and when I inquired about that for some of our 18, 22 year olds, there's nothing up this way. So it's a great program for all of our students. And I was wondering, how can we get that here? How can we get Berkshire Community College? Because that would be ideal for some of our, our students um, to be in those programs. So this is all things that, yes, it, it's definitely a work in progress. And it's just trying to find how we can get that going. Yeah. And I, can I just make a comment? And, and I, I understand that perhaps the it's really to, to, to you, Arn, of saying, well, the percentages of this budget increases of the percentage of that budget, and could we move that money? But when you're talking about students who need special services, they're not there because they're 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 not having space services they really need. And when you when you're a parent that goes through a situation where your child is not um thriving or not even really learning in the existing 
setting that was created for that child. I, I'm going to get a little emotional about it because the thought that we could compare, well, the percentage of the money for this to that, when there's a child who is not functioning in school because something is amiss. And when you go through that process of being like, what's happening here? And I've been through that. And you identify 504s in your budget. And I almost wanted to ask a question about why you mentioned that it's unfunded mandates because I get that. But most of our federal government doesn't pay. They pay a tiny portion of any of our education. So it's all an unfunded mandate. So let's just let that go. But our, our, both our legal and our moral mandate is to educate kids. And we use faith, and that's one of our wonderful alphabet soups. But our moral and legal mandate is to educate kids so that they can thrive and live in the world. And if one child takes a few more staff members to get them to a place where they can thrive in the world, then that's our mandate. And if another child, is, and we see so much wonderful work of students at the middle and high school who are very highly functioning, working with their peers and there's a lot of programming that has no budget line that talks about how do we act as a community i mean my daughter did an internship in what used to be called room 17 and i know we've changed the way we did that but the reality was she had an opportunity as an internship to learn and work with students with some of our higher disabilities down syndrome and other identifiers and learn so much and created an opportunity for her as a student to give back and work in a community so we, we, we do, we're not comparing apples to oranges. And when it comes to student services, I feel like sometimes we're actually underdoing what we need to do because students need tutoring to get them. You know, maybe it's the scaffolding. If we really look at the way students learn, we want them to fit into all of these categories, but they don't. They're human beings and they learn in the way that they learn. And sometimes it's a, it's a getting over the hump at third grade or fifth grade or sixth grade is a really tough one for some kids. But you put those supports in and you create that scaffolding. And then sometimes you suddenly see a ninth grader who doesn't need any of that. So the payback isn't dollars, but it's human beings who are functioning and feeling like they're part of a community. And opportunities for staff to not feel frustrated because they're pulled in 15 different directions and they know they're not actually meeting the needs of that student. There's nothing more wonderful than seeing a child who really struggled come to a place where they're not quite struggling anymore. And that takes talent and time and training and energy and care. And, and it, 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 it takes more when a student needs more. And that's just the way it is. And we could say, well, these students are really, they have a great time. They're good. They're top of their notch. Let's, you know, let's take, you know, the reality is we're just trying to take each student for who they are and what they're able to do. And, and I think when we can do that, that's what we're here for. And, and just, just to piggyback on that, you know, one of the costs, um, like I said, was the BARC, the BCARC, um, for our older students. And that what that's going to do is provide job coaching. So we have one student now who has worked at Maribel, um, and and he will now be working um, at, what did I say, Price Shepherd? Is that what it is? Yeah. March Market? Okay, I'm like seeing. I'm thinking back home what all these these grocery stores are. <laughs> I'm thinking chef, right? I'm thinking all those things. I'm sorry. Um, and so that so he'll be able to go into there with him, and you know they'll be able to provide services, job coaching while they're there, and then you know look at okay, well this is what you're doing, this is what you what you need to do. Um, so those are some really good services and. You know, can school, some school districts are, you know, they have um, staff that can go there. So when you have a student who attends um, Westfield State um, in their ICE program, and I'll, I'll get the acronym, acronym correct sometime, um, they actually have coaches, educational coaches, who will go with them and sit with them in class and take take notes for them. They'll go to, you know, they'll help them find a job on campus and take them for like recreational. So those are the types of services that, you know, we're looking to increase. Um, and so by doing this, this is the calculations. Any other questions? For yeah, I did. Um, so are you, you're in the midst of the tier focus policy? Correct. They'll be here um, the week of February 14th for um, special ed and um, civil rights. And week of March 7th, the EL um, OSM uh, will be here 
So that the self-assessment portion of it. So. Uh, so I completed the self-assessment, so they'll be coming in um, for the tiered focus monitoring for the special ed and the uh, civil rights. They'll be coming in on the 16th for in-person review of the files. And then they'll interview um, staff, myself, and Mark on the 17th. And then they'll give us their findings and kind so, of. So no identified target, did standards or anything? Not yet, no. Do, as I recall, it used to be an opportunity for parents to give feedback at some point. So they sent, um, they, we've had, that the, yes, we had a um, open forum last, Wednesday, I believe it was, last Wednesday. Um, so they had a Zoom, like a Zoom orientation for parents. They said they did send out um, evaluations or um, I forgot exactly the term that they used. They sent those out already and um, they will have a, an interview with the CPAC president, um, I believe on the 14th. So, so parents should have received something from them. If not, contact me and I will give you um, the name of um, Elena Podmore, I believe, is her is the person that's coming out. And what parents does that go to? I'm sorry. Which parents does that go to? Any yeah. students. Um, so we gave her a list of students um, on IEPs along with any contact information. So if students are in a final four or ELL or students are not identified as being services, there's not a point of contact for, for that. It's only students that are identified, families who have students who are identified as having services. Well, 504 is civil rights. Yes, but they've only asked for the students with um, IEPs for the contact the uh, roster for them. The They did ask for a roster for the EL students, mm -hmm. and that is March 7th. So it's, it'll be two separate okay. reviews. That has it, that just kind of, I think somehow, some way we might have gotten, forgotten a little bit. So they're coming in really quick, <laughs> whereas with the, the so special ed, it's right. yeah. two different departments. Just for the you know, viewers at home and everyone else, um, one of the funny things about special education, so you do get reimbursement from the state through this uh, mechanism called Circuit Breaker, which is um, when they give us money for uh, accelerating costs, um, you know, above and beyond the normal special education costs. Those are calculated in the current year, and you get them the following year. So, in one sense, you're always kind of um, a year behind in terms of receiving the money that you truly need to meet your needs. So you can have to borrow, you know, um, against the future in order to pay special ed costs. Um, I mean, it's great to get the reimbursement. Don't get me wrong, but it just that setup is not always the uh, most easy for folks to kind of see um, you know, how the circuit breaker gets applied. And and again, with circuit breaker you don't get the full reimbursement. So, you know, I, I just wrote down some, some figures. So we, <clears throat> our expenditures that we were able to claim were, were about $300,000. But after the foundation budget, about uh, the foundation piece, we could only claim 68,000 of that. And out of 68,000, we were only able to claim 75% of that. So we only got, not only, because the year before we got 39, so we got an increase. Um, but we got $51,000 back. So out of the 301 services that we claimed, we got 51000 for Circuit Breaker. So, you know, at, hopefully this year we're going to be getting more because um, they're now adding on the transportation that we can get reimbursed for transportation. So we're hoping that they're going to increase what we, what we are allowed to um, uh, get reimbursed for transportation. Or at least increase their percentage that they reimburse us. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it hovers around 60%. And it all depends on the, the finances of the company. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I just have two quick questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll let me do it. So uh, I, I noticed uh, one of the highlights was um, that you uh, have a full time school adjustment counselor. Uh, Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, in the spring, right, spring of 2020, I believe we hired. Just before we went down, uh, we went into the pandemic. Um, we hired um, a full time school adjustment counselor. Any opportunity to 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 expand or fill in um, 
My understanding is that there's not someone there every day in Morris for school adjustment counselor. Is is I don't, and I think that's correct. Is there any opportunity to expand to fill in those gaps at all? Honestly, I don't. I don't know. Um, I, I I don't know. I know that they were looking to hire a um, another full time adjustment counselor for LMMHS. Um, I don't know. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps down the road that, that if there was a retirement maybe we would look into requesting the it be a full-time position and, and my, my last question i promise is that i know in the past that there have been facilities constraints for special ed students there at morris um and there's been lack of suitable and appropriate spaces for children to take breaks um, and, and whatnot. Uh, and, and I wondered um, if, if, if that still exists and if that really should be something we should be talking about in this budget, you know, being able to provide or figure out how we can provide appropriate um, breaks and break uh, spaces or facilities. So the, the spaces that we use um, is we have the OT and the PT room, we relocated the room. Um, so there is actually a space there. And PT and OT are, are typically not there on certain days of the week. Um, so sometimes that room is, is empty, but we do share, they do share it with um, another department. Um, but for the most part, that is the room that they now use so it is, there is a room there for them to use um, on the ground level. I have one quick question. Um, does the, the work ever overlap between the guidance counselor and the school adjustment counselor? And is that person full-time as well? So the school adjustment counselor um, at Morris is responsible for the 504s. Okay. Um, and for the most part, she um, is the one that attends our meetings, our special ed meetings. Um, so, so she's kind of the special ed portion side of it um, versus uh, the guidance counselor. So it doesn't overlap in the sense that if the guidance counselor goes out, kind of fill in. So, and, and I know this was asked previously. So the distinction between the guidance counselor and the school adjustment counselor um, here at in Lenox, I'm, I'm not really sure where that came from because it was before my time. But I can tell you the guidance counselor um, at Morris, um, her job the majority of the day acts as a school adjustment counselor. If that answers your question. And that was the request for her to go full time next year when we're using part of the ESTER money. Right. But there's two separate people yes. talking about two separate Morris people we're talking okay. about. Um, they're, they're both 0.8s right now. They both are. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yep. And they okay. both work. Um, <clears throat> there's one day that someone is always there. Yes. Okay. So even with the, the one day that each may be out, or the other one is there. Thank you. And the proposal is for. For the guidance to be full time. One person, yeah. yeah. And our school adjustment counselor also um, services uh, pre K too. So she's. Okay. Moving on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. So our next budget to take a look at is our central administration budget. So I'll share my screen again so we can walk through that presentation. And so our central administration budget, um, we see a increase in school committee expenses, um, largely due to um, a contract that we are entering to with uh, MASC, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, to do a policy review to update our policy manual, make sure that we're in compliance with the law, 
and um, helping to make sure that um, all of the um, latest um, mass general laws are reflected in our policies. Um, and that'll help us, um, I think, clean up and um, improve our overall operations in the district. So uh, this is something that is a, a three-year project. And so um, each year we'll get uh, a piece of that cost of um, approximately $7,000 per year for the next three years. Um, additionally, there is a increase in the rates for um, liability insurance. And so that's reflected there. Um, and then, like we do with the rest of the budget, um, we did take a look at um, all the other lines based on actual expenditures. Um, you know, being zero based and being very lean was really important to us. And so, we didn't want to just park money in lines because, as we've historically done, we went back and did that five year look back. I asked Melissa to go through line by line and get real with the numbers so that, um, you know, we were giving her a lean budget um, and removing. Uh, as much of that extra spending that we could. Um, from the superintendent's office, um, some of the, whoops, um, what's reflected here are contractual uh, increases uh, due to salary agreements for folks that um, work out of our office. Um, we do see a reduction in the decrease in tuition that um, we will have to use, so the, um, happy to have that back in the coffers. Um, again, we're also looking to increase our, our payroll services to get to match the actual expenses. So sometimes we were able to save all the time to look back at that look back and saw that we were under budgeting. So uh, that's a little bit of cleanup there. Um, the next one is not as maybe clear as um, possibly me, but this is increased share of the data line. Um, that's our internet services. And so we do share that um, it's more departments in town. So our cost is uh, reflected there. Um, that's increasing. Um, additionally, um, advertising rates um, cost us more than maybe we've historically budgeted for. Um, we did a look back on the actual spending, um, and a lot of that's around posting of jobs. Um, and so uh, those costs are increasing uh, as well. Um, on the, the plus side for us in terms of saving money, um, by doing that close scrutiny of our lines, we were also able to um, see that we could save some money in uh, actual costs of printing, postage, uh, conference, uh, and travel uh, over time as well. So we've tried to tighten that up uh, accordingly. Um, we talked about the the bus contract last meeting, and so transportation services um, do come down with a um, an increase to us um, again. In one way, we're saving some money because we have a decreased need for um, a driver, um, but then kind of offset by an increase in the, the base rates that we have uh, as well. So in order to um, mitigate that cost and soften the blow, um, we are looking to use 2.5% um, um, from ESSER, or we used 2.5% from, from last year. Uh, so we're seeing, I think, an increase uh, as we move forward um, because we're kind of at the end of that uh, I would say cliff, but we want to make sure that we're being honest about where those mics are. We don't want to um, overly rely on that sort of balance the books without thinking about the future implications. So we're trying, I think, everywhere we can to say, you know, once ESSER is no longer done, or if we borrowed from ESSER last year to kind of balance the books, um, so we want to be honest about the true cost um, without that subsidy. That subsidy is not going to live on uh, in, perpetu in perpetuity. So we want to be sure that. Uh, being asked about that. So we see an overall variance uh, with an increase of um, four and a half percent, um, again, largely driven by um, those costs that we uh, identified on the previous slides. We look at the overall cost of um, where administration costs go, 62% of those go to administration, 33% um, does go to transportation. Um, as we have discussed, it is a, a large cost. I think that we are lucky in a sense that we were able to negotiate a pretty decent uh, transportation contract given that we know all the paying up on us. But again, that, that tends to be uh, very expensive, but still far cheaper than owning our own bus fleet and mechanics and garages and you know, routers and dispatchers and all of those types of things. So um, you know, I think it's still a good way to, to look at transportation. 
uh, and then five percent of that spending goes to uh, to you all and doing things that uh, help you um, to to your job is uh, whether that's pulse review or um, maybe it's PD money. Uh, so the small little uh, portion goes to the school. So. Do you mind if I interject at this point? It's about this portion and not about the maintenance, which is next. So I think it's really good in the school committee that we, you know, have cleaned up things that we haven't spent. I, I will encourage, you know, and some of us are new, some of us are new and not new. You know, I did attend the MSC conference and some people have different opinions about whether it's valuable. I felt this year particularly was extremely valuable. And so that was me attending that conference. I actually realized, I, and it's okay, I didn't submit for hotel and transportation, et cetera, but I really think it's important for people that can work that into their life, if you're interested, and I'm happy to share it, that we have some flexibility. You know, we can be very isolated out here in the Berkshires, especially and even in Lenox, as to what other districts are doing. And I think we hear from other leaders in education, either whether it's through interviewing processes or through superintendents. And when you get outside of the Berkshires, what, what other people are doing. And I just think it's, it's once a year, it's a very well um, prepared conference. We get a better sense of legislation upcoming. We get a better sense of connection with leadership and, um, and other people that, that are doing the work that we're doing. So I think it's good, but I also hope that we have some flexibility that people say, I really want to go to that conference. It's typically the first weekend, we can, like it overlaps a couple of days at the end of the week, the first week in November. Um, then I really encourage you to go. The hotels are pretty, it, but it's okay, it's fine. Um, but it's it really is a good opportunity, and I've attended a couple of times. Um, sometimes it's very kind of wonky and regulatory, and other times, like the most recent time, it's much more focusing on um, sort of the energy and the inspiration around education and what people are trying to do to make our schools better and do a better job. And um, I think that's important because we do sometimes get the weeds of this kind of stuff and it's good to look up and out, in, in my opinion. Um, so I hope we'll still have flexibility to be able to do that. It's not, it's not an expensive conference at all. No, and if you do sign up early enough, there is a discount. So um, I didn't increase that line item thinking that more would go because we didn't have you go last year. Mm -hmm. And you talked about how wonderful and how much you got from it. So. I did increase that line a little bit. That's it. Any other questions? Um, I don't know. I don't know if this fits in any budget, but it's, I, I guess it's a question for you. So I'll, I'll throw it in here. Sure. Um, you know, there's obviously been a lot of talk all year about DEI-related initiatives, trainings, curriculum review, etc. It doesn't actually show up as far as I can tell anywhere in the budget. So I'm just curious. If it is some, if it is in there somewhere, or if it's more still up the discussion phase and something we'll be spending on further down the road. Well, let's see. Trying to wait for your hand to answer that one. The ESSER grant does allow for uses like that, so we do have twenty five thousand set aside for professional development for DEI, and another twenty five for social emotional climate. Okay, and is that part of in terms of? final decision on how we spend that, then that's presumably not part of our budget process. When is the discussion about that? So I think that's an evolving discussion that's being uh, think, built out of our TLC committee of the uh, school committee and building out a, a multi-year plan for what that training will look like. Um, and so we're still in kind of the initial talks about building that out. Um, I. In my update to you this week, I will share the um, it's called Ready R E T I uh, it's Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion um, blueprint that was put out by the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents in coordination with DESE and NISC. So uh, you'll have a chance to kind of see what they're looking at at the state level and what they're asking districts to take on as well. Um, and that will also inform, I think, a lot of our decision making um, so that you know we are meeting with. Uh, what is being asked of us, uh, of all of us across the state by our State Department of Education. Um, the other piece in terms of, um, you also asked about curriculum, is that in the overall salary increases, we do have uh, $12,000 put aside as a stipend for um, a curriculum coordinator to, again, help spearhead the work that we need to do curricular wise, which I think Brenda kind of alluded to a little bit with some of the science work, but we do need to do a K-12 uh, curriculum alignment, both, both vertically 
and horizontally um, to, in order to get our accreditation from the end. And so uh, we want to make sure that we have somebody working on that project so that we can get that accreditation. Got it. Okay. So that's not a DEI audit of the curriculum. That's the NEAS. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, I'm going to share my screen again, um, and Melissa is going to present the maintenance and operations budget. So just give me one moment while I screen share. Melissa, I'll take your cue as someone to advance the slides. Okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> So this is the maintenance and operations budget, and it encompasses um, our buildings, the custodial services that we require to maintain our buildings, um, utilities, um, our grounds, equipment, all of those things that we need to operate school buildings. The custodial services line is really the um, area that has all the salaries for the custodians. Um, which includes at LMMHS, there's 5.5 custodians. One is a head custodian that basically is the, the point person for all that happens at that building, project-wise and <coughs> otherwise. And then um, at Morris, there's four total custodians. One is a head custodian, same, same um, responsibilities as at LMMHS, where they're the building, the, you know, the person that we go to for any issues at the building. Or the one that sphere has any projects that are going on. Um, so you'll see that uh, there is an, an increase in salary because of contractual obligations in that department. Um, and there is an increase in supplies. So custodial supplies would be you know, garbage bags for the building, um, supplies for the scrubber, things of that nature that just to clean the building and otherwise, you know, non- not exciting stuff, but necessary stuff. <laughs> and we did move some of that into ESSER uh, for custodial supplies last year. So that's where you're seeing <clears throat> a, a jump back up of 6,400 for the most part due to the monies that were moved over to ESSER. So the biggest part of this budget is the building maintenance um, and responsibility wise. You know, this encompasses all of the parts of the building, the HVAC, the boilers, the doors and windows, anything environmental, which we know has been going on, ongoing at <coughs> middle and high school this past year, um, pest control projects like roofs, um, the generator, and any supplies. That's the building maintenance budget. And there is an increase of 31,355. And again, if you look at these numbers, we're moving money back from the ESSER grant that we had moved out this for this year's budget. So uh, subs have been moved back in. And depending on whether or not they're used because of um, you know the pandemic, if we need more staff on because there has to be more cleaning, we can still apply some of that funding to the ESSER grants, but we have there has histor historically been money in the operating for subs in this line, and it is used. We <clears throat> use it. Um, contracted services. The majority of the fifteen five four four that was moved into ESSER was HVAC work. Um, now we have regular typical maintenance of the HVAC and boilers and. There is a bit of an increase in this one just to make sure that we keep those systems operating as they are. We spent a lot of time and funding to get them to a point where they were able to operate those building in those buildings efficiently for air quality and heating purposes. Uh, we want to maintain it now. Uh, there's an environmental contracted services line that is new in this year's budget, and that is. Echogenesis is now um, contracted with us as the designated person for our building. So what that is, is when you have asbestos in a building, you do have to have a designated person who monitors the asbestos, who keeps all of the records, who does the training with the staff. Um, that was done in-house. Echogenesis is now going to be doing it for us. 
um, at least for the foreseeable future. And that also would include any work if we needed to have any, if we had a small event or an event that we would need to contract out for. Um, pest control, like I said, is, is a, an increase of a thousand. We did have some issues at Morris and there were no, there was no budgeted money. So I want to make sure that we're covered there. Um, and that's really it. But that, the majority of it is money moved from that was funded in ESSER for this budget that has been moved back into the operating. And, and the pests weren't ending really nefarious. It's just no. some bees on the uh, playground. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, the equipment budget encompasses anything like, um, you know, a floor scrubber, um, a snow blower, uh, things like that, that would um, require maintenance and or additional, uh, you know, supplies to operate it. But the majority of this is the maintenance for the vehicle. The custodial department has a van. They also do our inter-office mail run every day. So that van is used for that and used for um, moving equipment around. You know, if we had to bring something over that could fit in the van over to Morris, it could they could put it in there. So it's for, the van is 2012. It's 10 years old. It only has 45,000 miles on it but it has required a bit more maintenance over the last couple of years. And that's where you're seeing that increase request. Um, the next part of the, the maintenance and operations is the grounds. And we do have subs again there. Typically these are used um, if we can't schedule a custodian to also help with the grounds during the day. So when you have just one day custodian, LMMA, LMMHS has two. During the spring, when the grounds need attention, one goes out, one stays in. Morris doesn't have that. Um, they have one during the day. And so sometimes we need to have a sub come in to, to assist with getting that <clears throat> stuff done so that our grounds look, look presentable and are, are good enough for the kids to play on. Um, supplies and equipment. Our five-year average was 9,408. The 2023 budget is at 12,175. We do have some older machinery that um, the custodians have requested a little bit more in their maintenance budget for. And contracted services all remain level at this in this department area, program area. So this is a graph that shows you where the, the money for maintenance operation, maintenance and operation goes. 61% custodial. Um, that again is the staff, the custodial staff, um, rubbish removal at the building and custodial supplies. The building's maintenance is 9% of it. Utilities are 26% of it and the equipment is 4%. Now utilities, um, the, the town does go out to bid for the utility rates every three years. So we're able to see where we don't see, and you see Berkshire gas prices going crazy. We don't necessarily see that impact because we have three-year contracts. Now we are going out again this year, but we're anticipating, I do have a slight increase in utilities, but I think we have a good base for what we'll spend next year, plus a little bit of uh, an in increase. Um, I know that the town is looking at a 5% increase. We're just under that. So the total budget for maintenance and operations is 22. It was 1.039 million. This year is 1.086. There is a 46,000 or 4.48 percent. And then one more slide, I think. Oh yeah, I like this graph. So <laughs> this graph shows you um, the purple is 2022. The black is 2023. So even though some of these percentages, and I think this helps to see. Some of these percentages and small buzz budgets really look like they're very, very high. But when you look at it in this comparison, you don't really see a huge jump in any one of these department areas. That's it. Okay, so I had a question regarding the um, ecogenesis. So is that the uh, HERA? Are they are now our 
asbestos hazard emergency, whatever yes. we are in the ATM for. Yes. yes. So the error booklet is still going to be kept here in district. Um, but there is one at LMMHS, and I have copies of some, but the main booklet is at LMMHS. And they will be, they provide the paperwork, and, and Jeff is still putting it in the booklet and keeping the booklet, but they're doing all of that. Okay. And there's no conflict of interest in that? No, it's a it's a separate contract. The, the air quality testing that they do is after an event or if we ask them to come. This is just the, the record keeping and they always did do the walkthrough of the building even prior to this. They'll be doing that as well. But this is record keeping and training of staff. We, we had a year or two ago given our lead custodian the um, responsibility for doing it. He'd been doing the error of paperwork for years and it was getting to be pretty intense. And it was only a year or so ago that we actually gave him a small stipend to do yeah, it. doing it without that. Um, and I don't have any idea what that was, but I was going to ask under the maintenance and operations budget, you had $2,500 of new money for service and support. And I wasn't sure. Maybe yeah, you had two line items that each had twenty five hundred, although one of it on the presentation or the well on the booklet. no on the massive mega book with the hundred somewhat page booklet. It was under it was under I don't know why I figured out over overview maintenance and operations and it was on the one two three the fourth page of the spreadsheet right at the top. And, I, and initially, I thought that must have been the, the money for. Can you tell me what the department is? Studio? It's a building make program building maintenance department 67. 67. Okay, thank you. Is, it, is that the paper page? Yeah. Uh, you know, hang on. Uh, we're on 129. So the services and support are the, those are substitute loans. Oh, okay. So okay. that would be- That was um, the 5,000 that you had. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I didn't want you to think I wasn't reading your budget. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> Just when you can't sleep, that's when you can look so I can't say there's anything missing. It's all there. So I guess the question I have, and it doesn't have to happen tonight, but do you have a sense of how much money that was in that service coming back into this budget? And we're going up five, whatever the percent is that we're overall budget is going up. And I just want to know if you if maybe by the end of next week or something, or at some point, you could let us know how much money is kind of coming back from ESSER to this budget. Yeah, I you know we had taken 123,000 out of the budget last year and moved it to ESSER. Um, it's not that full amount, but I will give you. Yeah, yeah, that just sense because you know I know that ultimately we want to have it in the operating budget, and it's appropriate to be in the operating budget. I'm just wondering like, what the order of magnitude was of that. I can I can have that for you because typically the net result of that is money that goes back into the. The general fund for the town if we had savings from grants or other things that unanticipated reimbursements, <clears throat> etc. Right. And so so grants would not go to the town. A lot of the grants that we receive are multi-year grants. So they stay with the school department. But if it's in the general fund, the operating budget, yeah. And anything there in this budget that you see now that is not Expended out of a grant would go back to the town if we did not spend it during the course of the year. Now, in any given year, you can you can spend the whole budget depending on the sort of year that you have. And in other years, and probably in most years, you have you have a percentage that is that does go back to the town because you can't possibly budget to the penny on every line item. And you can have a budget that you feel is solid. And the day it's voted on by the town, the next day something changes. Right. So you, you never know, but you have to be prepared for what you don't know and you think it's coming. 
And in particular, in the ESSER funding, that it's not concrete yet how much is going to be available for next year and what we'll be able to spend. Is that what, is that what you've been telling us? No, the ESSER, the ESSER grant, there were three ESSER grants. The third ESSER grant is available, and we did receive our first payment. Um, and it's budgeted for some of the items that we talked about, the professional development, um, some improvements to the, both buildings, um, the permanent substitutes that we've been able to put into one building, at least for now. Um, we're looking to amend it so that we can get that additional uh, school adjustment counselor at the middle and high school. Um, so we do have the third, and I believe probably the final grant for the pandemic. Yes. So that would be available to us. It began this year, which is fiscal year 22. We would have that until the end of 24, possibly September of 25, I think it may end. So it's here for a few years. And, but it comes with lots of strings, right? Yes. So you can only use it for COVID related expenses and or things that you didn't do because of COVID, right? So, which can be a stretch, you, you know, it depends on, you know, um, and obviously we're not in the game of like, you know, being, you know, untruthful, but like if we said, hey, we had to put off painting and we get a painter in because there were no painters due to COVID, then we can use it that way. So, um, but the auditors are very um, tough around this, especially on SR3. Uh, with each wave of ESSER, the um, the restrictions got tighter and the uh, audit, you know, that you faced became greater as well. So, um, you know, all this has been in, in contact with the other ESSER pieces. And um, again, they're, they're very strict, you know, um, and very good, I think, at looking through some of the thinly veiled things that districts have tried to pass off. Um, so, again, you know, we don't play games, we don't, you know, want to you know, get into that kind of thing. So uh, we'll be strategic about the usage of it, but you know, I'm going to be honest and forthright too. Were there any other questions for Melissa or Mark relative to these last two questions? Hearing none, why don't we move on? Uh -huh. So the uh, next item, I mean, could have really lived either in this report or in new business, but it was requested by the committee um, to have some space to have a discussion about um, COVID protocols and, um, and an update on that. Um, so I guess I'll you know kind of leave the conversation with um, just sharing that as everyone knows this, that um, DESE has changed um, some of the protocols around testing. Um, they call it the at-home antigen testing, and we did um, opt into that program. Uh, we had a lot of interest from our uh, families and our staff to uh, take advantage of this program, which basically adds a second round of, um, of weekly testing in addition to the um, PCR test that we do Tuesdays. Each Friday now we'll do an at-home test, and, and then folks would send us their positive results um, should they encounter those to the at-home testing. Uh, the upside to, uh, for us as district is one, we get a second round of insurance testing, but then even more so is um, it frees us up from having to do contact tracing, which you know, in my opinion was probably more effort than was worth. We weren't really finding a lot of cases through that, and it was tying up lots of uh, man hours to do that work. I think when Brenda talked about some of the paperwork, um, you know, they'll definitely tell you that was one of them. I talked to Jim Walsh from Tritown. Uh, I mean, he was just amazed at how much time they spent trying to track down a single case. Um, and so, you know, again, we're, as you said earlier, pretty lean operation. So that really stretches us pretty thin to try to do that contact tracing. Um, and so well, we're fortunate for that. Um, the move was wide, was widely supported by our nurses and our administrative staff. Uh, it was unanimous. Uh, we also put our JLMC who also unanimously supported it. So uh, we just rolled it out last week with the first round of tests and home for teachers. Uh, this week, we'll be sending them home for uh, families as well. So we're excited about that program uh, as we move forward. Um, as it stands at the moment, um, just to give you an update, we have um, I, our percentages of each building of vaccinated um, persons in our school community. So school community is defined as all of our employees plus all the students in the building. Um, and so at LMHS, 
We are at 81% of um, those folks in that facility being vaccinated. And at Morris, we're at 64% of folks being vaccinated. Um, and so Morris actually, uh, this is interesting, we had a pretty sharp uptick towards the end of the day as we learned of um, new folks getting vaccinated. So at the elementary level, um, more and more folks are getting fully vaccinated. So that's increasing on a daily basis there. Um, one of the strange kind of um, idiosyncrasies about Morris is that the our youngest students, our pre-K, are not eligible. So we have 26 students who cannot get vaccinated currently. Uh, there is uh, quite a bit of talk about expanding uh, the eligibility to our younger students. So, um, but that is always going to be a reality that's just going to have that that number of kids for the time being those rules change it cannot be vaccinated, but they still count in our count. It's not of eligible folks to total folks. So six or seven percent. So what's the percentage of eligible? So um, the percent of eligible, I. I didn't run that, but I can run that. Um, and, and all I have to do is just subtract off so, those, those 26. Um, I'm going to guess it's going to, you know, bring it up a little bit, but not a ton. You know, it might two. It's two kids or more. It's two point one or so. Three oh nine. Three oh nine. Three oh nine. I think it's two eighty six and up or two eighty three without preschool. Total. So yeah. And Mark, if it's 64 for Morris overall, what is that for Morris students? So for Morris students, um, we have 171 of the 309 students vaccinated at Morris, so 55%. And there, currently there are 11 students who have one dose, so we're waiting for 11. I know that we had several students leave today for the vaccine clinic that was offered, so. This is one for the media center today, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is great. So then at LMMHS, we're 81%. We could at least begin a conversation about whether we want to continue the mask and policy or not, based on Jesse's. Jesse's. Do, we have, do we have to ask for that permission? And so right now, we're, um, the chair, Chairman Riley said, Commissioner Riley said, the DESI mandate is till the end of the month of February right now. End of February, right. Unless you ask for the waiver. If you no, unless you're going to be 80% waiver. But you get it automatically, you have to ask for it. You have to ask for it. Yeah. Uh, it's not really ask as much as just saying you're doing it, and then I just have to affirm that we're at Okay. Um, so it's it's sort of a just an affirmation process, not a whole application or some oversight. Yeah, okay. yeah it's a pretty quick and uh, easy process. Okay. Um, and Mr. Miller, to answer your question, the percentage changes when you subtract out the um, the pre-K kids from 55% of those students to 60%, which brings the building from 64% overall to 68 overall. To 68? Yep. And, and again, that'll continue to change, um, you know, trending more positively as more kids get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things there, too, is we had a number of kids who had COVID, so they had to wait before mm -hmm. they could get the, the uh, final dose. So I guess the question then becomes, do we want to make a, do we want to make a decision about the high school? I'd love to have a discussion about it within the group, just to kind of see where everybody stands on it. Um, I do know as of January 14th, Dusty uh, granted 31 school districts uh, with vaccination rates, 80% or higher, um, permission to lift the mask mandates. Of course, you know, if students choose to wear them, that's totally fine. Um, I'm not saying you can't wear them. Um, but I think it's important at this point, knowing especially that we are just over the 80% mark to have um, some, some discussion surrounding it. And what is our um, let's see, commitment? I mean, obviously, I know the policy decisions are made here, but um, in our collaboration with our joint labor management, that's what you're calling it, the joint labor management committee, in just being able to talk about this decision, I mean, because we have faculty, we have students, we have a whole community. Um, I know our faculty are actually at a higher percentage of people who are vaccinated, but um, do we have a, a commitment to go back to them before we make a decision? Um, so if the policy is written currently, we do, right? The JLMC um, has to have that discussion. Um, and if it wants to be the, the policy, clearly the board's always, you know, at liberty to create any other policy they want that would, you know, supersede that policy. Um, so, you know, if that's the 
the direction you want to go, that, that's always an option. But if we're going to stick with the existing uh, relationship that's been established, that would be going through the JLMC um, and having that discussion there. There's one that I have, is I, I believe our next meeting is next week. It's just a week from tonight rather than a long, prolonged. And I just think in general, we're working within, within a community where a small community we've always talked about that. We want to try to be transparent and cooperative. So I think it, we should continue the conversation, but I would just suggest that we, if it's possible to convene that group this week and try between now and next meeting to really just, you know, have that conversation at that level as well. If there was a strong opposition to a change, and we discuss that next week, which doesn't mean that we are bound by it, but I think it's just out of respect, it'd be important to feel like that conversation is happening um, openly, transparently, rather than, again, it's a week. It's not a question of, um, you know, we're not meeting again for a long time. And that can be arranged. The only thing that I would, you know, wonder about is that the JMC gives us two voices in the conversation, right? So it gives us the administrative voice and it gives us um, and the school committee voice um, kind of on, on one side and also the, uh, the voice of our employees. Uh, what's left out of that conversation is, is parents. And so, um, you know, if we're gonna entertain this discussion, I'd be inclined to maybe consider putting on another survey to families to see where they are maybe, you know, thinking has evolved over time. Um, you know, and I think that would help, you know, make a, a more sound decision if they have a little bit of input. I mean, again, it's not gonna do it by popular vote, but at the same time, I think it's helpful maybe to have more voices in the conversation than just those two stakeholders. Is there another JLMC meeting? We don't, but we have no problem scheduling on it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, it's something to consider a little bit. First of all, the, some form that community has guided a lot of the decisions along the way the last couple of years. It, it would, I think, be very good protocol to have them in the lead on the conversation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then, secondly, is I think we need to plan around the other side of that scenario. We're trying to take the mass off. What's the trigger point for bringing them back on? Because the way this has been going, we're going to end up cycling back into another. another Something. So we should be ready for um, how to make a decision. You know, like, much like we did with COVID, right? we're constantly evaluating the situation, making adjustments as needed. So that would be a good good feedback to get from that group. What are the, what are the KPIs we should be looking at yeah. and decide? And I was thinking, in terms of the timing on the we talk about you know, next week. Um, next week is the high school and uh, the very lengthy presentations that we'll have next week. I was actually thinking since we meet on the 28th that and there's going to be a vacation week in between that if I don't see a downside to wait for the 28th to make a decision, we'll have more time to discuss it as a committee. Yeah, we may not need a lot of discussion, but um, but we will you know, Mark will have had time to get feedback from parents. JLFC will have a little bit longer frame to meet. Um, and and we can make the decision on the 28th. Well, right now, I, I the Desi rules only in effect through the end of February, right? Mm -hmm. it, which, uh, do we have any insight? I know we can't see into the future, but as to whether they would lean towards it. I checked the Desi website today to see if there's any updated guidance, and, and there's no, nothing has happened. I mean, they they meet once a month. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I, I, I first of all, I disagree with the idea that there's no downside to waiting a month. There's a month of every element each student having to wear a mask which many of them undoubtedly don't want to do, much as any of us choose not to do so every day, much as last week we took our masks off every time we had something to say to the whole meeting. So I, I certainly don't think there's no downside. Um, we could, and, and I think we need to acknowledge that every day we just let inertia um, leave policies in place. We're really doing students a disservice. Um, I was just, uh, as a point of clarification, when we signed them away with uh, the LEA over the summer, we actually did resolve this question. The final provision of the MOA says, pursuant to DESE guidelines, if any district school reaches 80% total vaccination status, the JOMC will relieve that school community of the masking requirement. Um, so under the MOA, insofar as Mark makes the determination that we are at 80%, We've in fact already agreed, both the school committee and the LAA, 
that the mask should come off. What will we've agreed to absolve them of their responsibility? Not that we've agreed that it'll take off, but agree that it would be our decision, not necessarily, they're, not, they're absolved. It, the way I would read it, they're absolved of the responsibility, it then shifts to us. Sure, if, if we still want to, as a committee, deliberate further, we can, but, but we had already worked through a, a little bit to Bob's point that, you know, we need to have KPIs for these things. This is the one KPI we actually move out, discussed, and said when we get to 80%, at least for purposes of discussion with with the LEA, um, that that everyone was at least at that time leaning in the same direction on it. Um, I guess I also just wanted to make sure we widen the discussion a little bit beyond masks, which is obviously the sort of hot button issue. But there are all sorts of things still going on in the schools that are intended to COVID mitigation, and I. Personally, I'm very skeptical is, is having an effect. Um, I, I sent the basic chart around Massachusetts did not achieve any mitigation success against Omicron relative to states with, with much weaker uh, or more lenient approaches. And so just as I think about things like, I believe the students at, at Morris are still sitting five feet apart, all facing the same direction at lunch. Is that? Yes. Um, so there's that. I believe there are still signs on the doors telling adults in the community they shouldn't enter the buildings. Um, I know that, at least in Morris, there are a lot of parents who are facing real challenges sending their kids to school in the face of guidance that they need to be in their kids' home, that this testing protocol, that testing protocol. And so it seems to me that it would be appropriate to have a conversation you know, masking is the one piece of this we have the least control over, in a sense. Um, so at, at least at LMHS, at this point, we do have a lot of control over it. Um, but, but there's a general sort of posture toward COVID. And, and that's why I requested that we sort of think about this concept of an off-ramp and, and really as a committee ask, what is it that we think we are accomplishing at this point on whose behalf and at what cost? And I think we for the last two years asked children to bear extraordinary burdens, despite themselves not being the ones who were especially at risk for the sake of those who were vulnerable in the community. Uh, and at this point, everybody in the community uh, who, who would have been especially vulnerable at, at least age five and up have, have had more than adequate opportunity um, to become fully vaccinated. And, and so just to, I, this just really jumped out at me from um, Dr. Kenny, the, the chair of the of Tri-Town. At the meeting last week, at, at the Tri-Town meeting, he said, um, for Omicron, for people who are fully vaccinated, it's evolving into something that's not much worse than the common cold. Um, so, I guess my recommendation would be that, that the committee adopt a policy that obviously we're still going to comply with whatever mandates or requirements or laws are on the books, um, but that beyond that, it is the clear expectation that that business be returning to normal. And I guess to the extent that committee members don't want to go that direction, it, it would just be helpful to understand why not, or, or what else would we still plan to wait for? No, fair point. Fair points. Yeah. It took us two years to wind all this stuff together, and how do we start to unwind it? Yeah. Well, I can tell you how we unwind it. I can think of motion <laughs> and and policy in school could be different tomorrow. But that, that wasn't my question. My question is, why aren't we doing that? Well, I think, that, like you said, masking is one portion of this, right? So up until today, there was some uh, confusion about testing um, protocols within the school nurse's office, particularly at Morris. Uh, what's considered, you know, the list of COVID symptoms could cover anything from a stomach bug to allergies to a sinus infection to COVID to the flu, you name it. Um, there's some massive confusion around whether or not we can even test vaccinated students anymore. Um, it, it, there's there's some disconnect, I think, between what Desi has put out, and I don't think any of us are surprised by that, um, and communication with uh, our school community, right? So 
Um, I think as a whole, we need to really look at these policies and start deconstructing them. Can I ask a question of just Paul, what you said about sure. the confusion is that some people are saying you can't adequately test a child who's been vaccinated, or no, they're so, saying they're not, so they're testing, not accurate. Yeah, Jessica originally had a policy that said that if a child um, was vaccinated, that you couldn't test them because the vaccine would trigger a false positive. Now, that was, I think, a backward looking um, and a, a space bound uh, assumption at the time. Pre Omicron, we saw these breakthrough cases. Yeah. I think now, you know, maybe the calculation is different given what we know about, you know, this variant and all the other subvariants. But, um, you know, so, but what Desi doesn't do a good job of is cleaning up that kind of like legacy information that's out there. In fact, even when you look at their, their updates, it starts with whatever was served and they kind of build on from the bottom, but they never take the old stuff out. And so people are kind of left wondering. Is this still good or not? And so I think that's where some of the confusion lies with looking at some of Desi's protocols. I'm sure they've all been just as you know confused as some of us have been in trying to navigate that. Um, so I literally cut through the chase today and reached out to Desi and said, like, you know, what's the story? Like, if we have a kid who's symptomatic, can we test them? And they were like, yeah, you can do, you can do that. Like, but you know, previous were told, no, if they're not full testing, you can't test them. Like, you know, you're symptomatic. And we thought, well. That makes no sense. Okay. Yeah, right. You know, if the, if the object is to, you know, keep our community safe, like, you know, let's have some sort of common sense middle ground. And so um, I was happy to, to receive the, the response from them today. If my feeling about it, and, and or thank you for bringing that forward, because there's been many agreements and I don't have them all committed to memory, but that was actually why I wanted to suggest that we have a an announcement today that we're deliberating on uh, this is what we're looking at. Go to the committee, we're back here on Monday because I feel like that's a very short amount of time. And I do feel that there are families that were that are impacted, especially when we think about the elementary school. Um, and I know we're not, I'm assuming we're not talking about maybe we are talking about the elementary school, but we we haven't reached the 80% at the elementary school. So it seems that it would be premature to do that uh, unless you also want to have a discussion about that, which Oh, it's, it's, it's pretty sure, there, but there are other things we're still doing. At the right. Office. So, and I definitely think we need to move in a in a in a some type of a direction if it's possible. It keeps feeling like it's possible, and that it it gets pulled down the line. So, I just feel that with one week away, it's worth it to say, let's have a conversation. Let's include parents. You know, we did. And I hear you, Orm, when you say in a larger number, people, you know, the children are not as vulnerable. We heard some pretty compelling conversations of families that deal with children with serious illnesses, and those children are trying to be in our schools and live as normal a life as possible when they have very serious things. So I do think that we, and those children can wear, wear masks, certainly, and I understand that some families should and would make a choice that, and even some staff members would make a choice to wear a mask because of their own health needs, and we would encourage and support that. Um, but I just feel like we don't want to suddenly tell someone, okay, everything's shifting again tomorrow and you are not had a chance to be heard. I mean, it, it, I don't think it needs to wait till the 28th, um, but I, I just am asking that we continue the conversation next week with some real specific that this is what we're going to be talking about. And, and you know, and I want to learn a little bit more. I mean, you know, we take the masks off and there are other ways in which, you know, you know kids are eating and other things, like the masks come off. The rules about how they sit in the cafeteria should probably be up too. I mean, at, at LMMHS, though, they're having a much more, how are they behaving in the high school for the cafeteria? So, I mean, I think in the, in the high school cafeteria, things have been okay, but I think, you know, in talking with uh, Mr. Knievel, you know, he is saying, I think we can go back to um, regular seating uh, because the way that kids tend to seat naturally they sit in the same places you know most days anyway so even you know if we had to kind of try to figure this out even though we're not the contact trace anymore that if we had to contact trace you know because that was you know up to until a week ago what we had to do um then he could have done that pretty easily um so you know he's really looking forward to being able to get back to a normal lunch set in the cafeteria um you know and so that's the feedback that i've gotten from from there um the only thing he's uncertain as to like when the you know committee thinks that it's the right time, uh, but you know he seems to think that uh, it wouldn't really change much by going back to a normal lunch. <laughs> and then that raised another question that I understand. I saw the notice today. So I think it was reported in the Globe about conversations are. Oh, maybe it came from you about shaking hands again. 
uh, students being able to shake hands at oh at, at sporting events. I don't know. I was, I was trying to get my work today, so it came up about saying that the MIA is encouraging the sportsmanship, like if it's not an actual handshake, it'd be a fist bump or something where um, athletes acknowledge each other rather than staying away from each other because feeling that that presumes some level of collegiality and sportsmanship, and that was in the, in the discussion. Um, but I believe the MA will still have a mask mandate because you'll have mixing students, you know, students from different schools that may or may not have looked at the mask so that when they're in the competitions, they would have masks anyway, I presume. So right now, any indoor event for MIAA uh, requires student athletes to wear masks, regardless of what the day-to-day, -day, you know, realize that school say, I know like for a fact that Lexington is one of the school districts that was able to um, reach an extent and um, we're no longer requiring masks, at, um, it was optional. But again, if Lexington plays, you know, Lennox on the game, um, those students, you know, would have to still wear masks during that, let's say, basketball game in the West. And again, when it comes to spectators, we have a wide variety of people, so perhaps that we have to think about that too. So we'll be having visitors wear masks or we're having spectators wear masks. So then you yeah. go into the sort of, in a, you know, we just want to be really clear. The you know, guideline is for all folks indoors. So that's the athletes, that's spectators, referees, everybody. At that event, must be masked. And that's the current role for indoor sports. Yeah. So there are definitely some things that are beyond our control at this yeah. time. Uh, but I think what, what what I'm referring to more is like the low hanging fruit, right? Like yeah. like there are things that we could be implementing. And, and I, I hope it's okay if I ask you, Brenda, to kind of share your thoughts on the the, the lunch yeah. seating so, arrangement at Morris, and if there's anything holding you back from that. So here. Ideally, if I wanted to have the cafeteria tables back after Martin Luther King Day, that was like my goal. Two weeks we come back, everything's going good, and then I'm recommended. So now my goal was when we come back from February vacation, but it just needs a little bit of planning because um, there is always like lunch seating and things like that um, and to notify the parents. So uh, trust me, I think about that every single week. I mean, we use the cafeteria not just for lunch, but for professional development and we've had to do a lot of things differently so the sooner we can get everything back to normal the better um so that is something that i'm always thinking about and i think last week's pool testing counts were extremely um encouraging i think right we had uh, one one student one student mm -hmm. from each school um because where it was the eight was the week before right yeah that's yeah. yeah. from last week to 25th i think well, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I i were sort of we quickly go back into each particular thing and what we have control over and what, what don't we. I do think part of this committee being effective is going to be setting a clear standard and way of approaching it and then asking the administration to make sure it's acting accordingly, not sort of going group, group by group, space by space. And so, you know, Ryan, I think your point about you know, people are still vulnerable is, is exactly the, the right one to raise. I, I think the reality is that we are at a point where these dangers, again, for people who are vaccinated, people who've chosen not to be vaccinated are facing a different situation, but I don't think our policy should be on their behalf. And generally, if they've chosen not to be vaccinated, they, they don't want the policy on their behalf either. Um, for people who become vaccinated, and, and this is exactly the point Dr. Penny was making, COVID just isn't COVID anymore, the, the way that we thought about it. it. Are there people who are still uniquely vulnerable to respiratory infections? Absolutely, but not more so than to influenza, you know, for the littlest kids than to RSV. And so I, I really think it's important and, and totally, we don't make any decisions tonight, but I think it's really important that everybody come next week prepared to make decisions based on an answer to the question, why are we still doing any of this? Who is it that we're trying to protect? What are we trying to protect them from? And to what extent do we actually believe any things we are doing are having that effect? Because again, it's a very crude measure, but Massachusetts did exactly the same or actually slightly worse than Florida with Omicron. It, that's just the reality. And, um, at the point where, unfortunately, we have a high vaccination rate overall in Massachusetts, at the point where, you know, the, you also have the decoupling from hospitalizations and so forth and the strain on the hospital.
in, in my mind, what that really points to is fact that it's not actually a, a question of expertise at this point. I mean, Denmark just lifted all COVID restrictions as of today. Um, they have excellent public health experts in Denmark, and conversely, there are, well, I don't know if there's anywhere more intense than Massachusetts, but there's Massachusetts, which clearly has not on that route. And so I totally agree that, that the public health input is incredibly important. I guess I would just want to hear from you a little bit more how, what you're actually looking to hear from them. I mean, it, it could be, for instance, it doesn't seem to me we should prioritize what somebody at Tritown Health thinks over leading public health experts nationally. But again, that there's disagreement among them because it's not really about yeah. the science at I, this point. It's it's a it's yeah. a values question. I, I guess I, I, I guess you know I, I'm looking at it not necessarily. First of all, I, I, I guess it would be local because you, you, I, I think you would need to limit the database that one pulls from, and it may as well be local as a pulling from you know globally. Um, and, and I guess I, I guess I'm looking at I guess I'm, and perhaps I'm idealistic in the view that I'd be looking at someone that's pulling in the, the global amount of data, not picking and choosing um, data to, to fit a, an opinion or have an opinion piece and, and, and pick you know this data point and that data point and put them together, but rather someone that's, that, that's synthesizing the entire um, a body of information, and I think that's where, um, uh, and and that's where. Look, everything is there, there's an, there's an opinion component to everything, but that is indicative. And if you follow the path of data, then you get then you get a result. It may not be positive, but it's indicative. But and, so what, and, and what so, are you looking for? Well, I don't know. You got to follow the data. Well, which what what sources of data? What 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 data points would influence your decision? Uh, the culmination of the indicative data. I mean, the, the person who synthesizes it all, or the groups that synthesize it all. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to express here. If, if we're going to say there's data that can give us the answer, what what data are you looking for? What piece of information would help you make the decision? Uh, you would look for the synthesis of the entire uh you look where the data where the data goes which data the whole body of data so and give an example of a piece of data that should inform this well you know data can be positive and negative it can it can support your theory it can debunk your theory but at the end of the day it all funnels down to which was it did it debunk it or did it support it that's the way data works well, and just to some degree, you know, when I hear you about you saying, well, Denmark this, or we could say that about a million different places, but we do actually have a Tritown Health Department. I mean, we're elected to the Lenox School Board, School Committee. The Tritown Health Department is hired, appointed, whatever, however their authority. And so to some degree, I think we're looking at them as our local health healthcare experts, if you want to call it that, to give us some information. They've been in the conversation. I don't think it's the only point. I don't think it's the only data point. I don't think it's the only thing we need to know, but... It, we're not going to sit here and convene over a hearing and have, as you said, 10 experts of this and 10 experts of that. The way we proceed is, is dealing with a couple of entities. We've had DESE, because that's our governing body of our state institution of education, and they do have some authority over us, not 100%. And then we're looking at our local Tritown Health, and I think that just kind of makes sense. And each of us are going to talk to people we like to talk to. I like to I like to email my doctor, who's a local community member, and kind of get, get ourselves a sense of what, what we're trying to do. It seems to me the Triton Health is already part of the Joint Labor Management Committee, and, and that just seems to that seems to make sense to me that we have their input. If they're not available and they don't want to give it, then we, we march on and we make our decisions. But I think that's... Actually, I'll, I'll tell you, about, right? oh, if, if we're not broadcasting, I'll tell you. I, I'm not opposed to, to, to looking at this and, and looking at where she are. My, my at that point is my son, who's like no one is is following good math protocol and MMMH, LMMHS. So, um, so I, I actually really think that there's, but I can't use my son as a data point. 
I mean, it's his opinion. He's there. He's looking at him. He's like, people aren't. They're walking around without masks. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're close to each other. And we got low numbers. But I can't use that. Data. So can I, I'm going to put Mark on the spot for a minute. Sorry, Mark. But, um, so Dr. Weston Element is a infectious disease specialist at Harvard Medical School. And I know that she spoke to the Massachusetts superintendents. Do you mind sharing a bit of her opinions that this is someone's opinion that I would value tremendously as an expert in this field. Yeah, so I mean, I think what she was advocating um, when she spoke to us was, I think again, support for moving away from contact tracing as we're um, starting to consider other ways to to mitigate COVID. I think she also was trying to. Um, further the the concept, um, which again, she wrote about in the Washington Post as well about mitigation of risk and where is that that balance um, of the health of students and their social emotional development um, and also in um, the risk of, of preventing the disease. Now, I think what Element left out, if I could editorialize a smidge, I would say is that um, there are some students who also, um, while masks may have impacted their social emotional development, there are others who um, also are, are fearful and that taking off masks is also um, a psychological um, you know, thing that they would have to wrestle with. And so that's another balancing act. Now, again, maybe choice can solve that. I'm not sure, right? But that's another thing that we hear. And I, as I look at this, this broad picture, I hear Element, I think she uh, makes a very compelling point. I think that we do have to start to look at life after COVID. I cannot wait for that day. But at the same time, one of the things that still sticks with me personally is seeing the numbers of absences, uh, which is just starting to smooth out a little bit. And, um, you know, the number one priority for me, you know, as a, as a school leader and as a district leader is keeping kids in seats, right, and in schools. And so, um, you know, whatever decision we make, I want to make sure that, we're trying to take that into account as well. Um, that we're just finally starting to see that, both from our staff and from our from our students and from our staff, right? So staff attendance has been way up the last couple of weeks. Things look better. Uh, student attendance is finally getting back to you know what it was pre Omicron holiday spike. Well, I think that's where risk tolerance comes in, though, right? I mean, I don't think anybody in this room would say you would ever tell someone they can't wear a mask or, or treat that person differently for deciding to continue to wear a mask. Um, but I think that that's important to talk about is everybody has a different level of uh, comfort when it comes to risk. And I, that's what I think she kind of hammered on. Yeah. And, and I do think we should adhere to the sort of follow the science value that has been um, so central to a lot of these debates. I mean, to say, you know, these children should wear masks, even though we all grant that they're not actually accomplishing anything. If, if maybe we don't grant that, but if, if we can't say anything, they're actually accomplishing, but the children should still wear them because that makes other people feel better. Um, at, at some point, if, if we're going to, again, if, if we're following the data and, and the public health model, we need to actually do that. So, you know, I, I understand we're going to discuss it more next week. I, I think if if it's possible to have someone from Tri Town here to answer questions and, and explain how they would think about it, I think that would be tremendously valuable. Um, but I, I don't think a sort of written statement from Tri Town up here, you know, here's what we think um, gets us anywhere above the written statements from people who are advising superintendents statewide, you know, who um, who are at least qualified at the end of the day, I, I, I really do think it comes down to a question of it's, 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 it's a political choice. We can all look at the exact same data and we're going to have to decide, are we ready to give kids normal school back? And, okay. and if not now, when would we be, we be ready? Yeah, one of the problems is it's, uh, we're making conclusions, not, not making conclusions, it's it's um, yeah, it's conclusions by omission. You know, you wear a mask. No one's you know these are these are the levels. It's not like levels were high. We put masks on and all stopped. It's it's you know you really only find out if masks work 
in, in our setting, if, if you take them off and you've got indications in other places that they do, um, but I must say from personal experience with Omicron, with a student, it's a bit flippant um, for the good doctor, uh, Kinney, right, Kinney? Kenny. To say Kenny. it's just like the, it's right. just like the dumb so call. I mean, right. no, they've not sat in a room and heard the hacking. Right, but now the he's headaches. specifically dismissing the expert who you most wanted to consult in favor of your personal experience. Uh, well, I don't so know. I don't know I, well, actually, he's. <laughs> Well, no, no, you're, again, you're picking one person, not necessarily an, epi an epidemiologist. I mean, not, you're, you're not looking at the whole body, you're looking at that gentleman's opinion that it's a common cold. So that's not where I, would, I wouldn't use his, his opinion. Um, but now you're kind of picking and choosing the data that you use. Like, no, 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 I'm not picking and choosing. I'm saying he's not the person I would go to. I, I would just encourage that maybe we we've decided that we're going to reconvene, and I don't want to stifle anybody. But it feels well, like it's getting, it feels like I'm getting, I'm like like I'm getting into a little bit of a back and forth, and I don't think that that's. So so is it fair to say that we can invite the board of health to an emergency JLMC meeting this week? Mark and I will uh, work on that together, and then additionally, um, I'm open to seeing if they maybe Amy or Jim would join us on Monday to do some question and answers. Sure. I think that you know? makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also, Mark, if one other request I think would be helpful to really center on exactly what we're deciding, meaning if we could just spell it out on a slide, you know, if we here here is what we can choose. Is if we um, seek the waiver, you know, whatever the right terminology is from Desi, that 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 results in this clear statement, like masking has now become optional for the entire school community or whatever it actually means. And then the other the other pieces of it, you know, other other things that follow, meaning would Mike Nibel say, well, we need to rearrange the lunch. I, whatever else is in there, I think those all should just be laid out. So we're not kind of guessing. And that's where I want to keep on something. We're not going back to normal. Yeah. There is no normal now because even with Omicron, even though children weren't deathly ill, we almost couldn't staff the bills. So if you can't, you have to keep that in mind too. There's, a, there's something out there that can make people sick enough they can't come to work. And it, go, it was going very fast and we lost a lot of staff, we lost a lot of students, we didn't have very many students in the building. So there isn't gonna be a norm. I don't think it's important to say, it's not that they couldn't come to school because they were too sick to work. That, that, that was not the only problem. Yeah, I, but that's the problem I'm referring to, is that people were too ill to come to work, period. Forget what they had. They did not feel up to the task of performing their jobs. They weren't restricted. They just weren't up to the task of doing the job. So that was a problem right there. And there's going to have to be, you know, we've seen it more, there's going to have to be response plans and things still in place still measures for vulnerable kids. Not going to be no. We can, we can improve things a great deal, I think, and loosen things up a great deal, but never like it was two years ago. Okay. It's not in your future. Can I just make one comment? One comment. Just like when we were, no, were notified we were getting Teddy, we had students who are fearful of dogs, so we had a plan for that. I'm just asking for a plan yeah. for that's just what we need because we do still have some students who might be fearful of certain things and just planning for their social emotional health yes. um, would be very helpful. Just like we when we planned for Teddy, we just need to plan for the next step. It's a completely reasonable and valid request, which is why we need to consider everyone else who's affected so we can actually do the change management piece of this. That's what making a policy decision tonight would ignore. We don't have the ability to work through and, and engage people and actually make them comfortable because there, there are going to be people on both sides of the question, undoubtedly. You know, people who are upset if we move now, people who are upset if we don't move now. Yeah. And you can't please everyone. There is no one answer that will make everyone happy. We're just going to have to work through it either way. But we need to know what we're walking into. Okay. Uh, um, maybe in closing, maybe not. Um, the difficulty with having the public health people come next week is we have typically tried to have the meeting when the high school presentations are be strictly high school presentations because of 
the sheer number of people who will be coming to this and um, and that will be lengthy in itself. And so to have Jim or, or, Amy. Yeah, or Amy come is fine, except if we have them at the beginning, it pushes all our teachers till 11 o'clock at night. And if we have Jim and or Amy come, it pushes them to some unknown point. Can we meet separately to discuss? I think it's a big enough topic where it might we, warrant a, a much we shorter could, meeting. But we, we could definitely have a separate meeting. I don't want to take away from the high school. No, 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 because that's going to be, it's, and they all have to teach the next day. Right. Which is why we tried to just keep it, keep it, you know. I think. Uh, but we could have a meeting a just meeting. about this. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that way we can. I'll stay on topic and not have to worry about, you know, taking up other people's time. Thank you guys for staying this late. Thanks. <laughs> um, yes, you go by the way. You don't need to stay. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. So when are we, um, when can we just quickly discuss if we can try to put something together? If, you know, you want to have the JLMC meeting first, right? Yeah, I mean, we we often meet on an emergency basis, and we we're pretty good right. at pulling people together. Um, I'm going to work with Amy and see if we can get that scheduled for her um, mid this week, maybe Wednesday. We could we could meet we could meet perhaps as early as Thursday if if we post it. I mean, are people available? Look. The JLMC does not need to be posted. It's not an elected or. I think he means the, the meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I just have a quick question because I know you're meeting with your labor team on Tuesdays. What time do you meet? Four to seven. I was thinking about we, we met at seven. The reality is that, like, if it was only about the health, it's the next day after our budget meeting. If, we, if Tuesday we met after you met as labor, some of the people are here. Staying a little longer, but that's it, tomorrow. It would be the no next Tuesday. Oh, okay. No next have, Tuesday. We so we don't have any. It's every other. Yeah. Oh, so you don't have anything next week anyway. The eighth. Eighth. It would be the eighth. Yeah, but the eighth. I, the eighth, I have school building committee. Um, I guess the question would be if there's other committee meetings that are meeting here, and we just piggyback them, and we only dealt with that one issue. I'm only guessing that our meeting it might be long, but it wouldn't be as long as a whole meeting plus. But I think the, I mean, in my opinion, I, I'd like to have the separate meeting ahead of time before the next. Uh, before Monday's meeting? Yes. Yeah. Well, we've, we've got do. another meeting you're trying to wedge in between. So I'm just, and we've yeah, got no, no, so I, I understand. Thursday, yeah. I just feel like it's a little tight. We have to notice, notify that tomorrow, and we don't even know if we've got the other meeting. So realistically, if it's not, I mean, maybe Friday or Tuesday really seems to be the closest days available. Why not Thursday? Because you still have to find out when your meeting's going to happen. It hasn't been scheduled yet. You notice the meeting and cancel it. Right, right. We can we yeah. can post a we can post a school committee meeting for Thursday night and then cancel it if we if if they haven't been able to have their meeting. I do that. And the JLMC has been great about. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but they've okay. been pretty good about you know getting together when something is urgent. I would be okay. I'd be okay with that Thursday. So Thursday at six thirty. Any, any uh, receptivity to having it slightly earlier? I agree. I'd be open, open to earlier. I'd be open to earlier. Me too, it's my birthday, so earlier would be better. Oh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring you a card, Mark. Oh, no. how, how, how early could, could people do it? I could be here at 5, 5.30. Bob, Same. I know you travel. 5.30? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Doesn't matter. All right. So we'll we'll uh, post it for five thirty. Amy. Okay. Yes. With only one topic. Okay. What are we calling that topic? We're going to call it. Um, COVID protocols. Mask mandates. Off ramp from off ramp from COVID? Question mark. Question mark exclamation point. Exclamation point. Well, uh, <laughs> oh, never mind. It's the question mark. Uh, the exclamation well, point. Well, which exclamation points really matter? Like, which punctuation matters? That's really the question. Listen. 
<laughs> Some of us are classically educated. Can I, can I just jump in while you're talking about calendars? Because we mentioned the 28th, and at the last meeting, we had asked that we would schedule the 28th because I'm going to be on a plane. Yeah, we've yeah. decided to go with the 28th because other people were just saying we scheduled the meetings, we need, we need to try to stay because um, it was going to be difficult. Other people weren't going to be available if we moved it. Okay. And we thought well, I didn't take know it. that you decided that because we talked about doing it. Um, but we thought we'd take the chances that you'll actually will get here. No, no, I'm going to be on a plane, so I can't. Do oh, I thought you were overnight until, yeah, until the next day. No, no, I'm actually going to. Oh, okay. I thought you were. It was a matter of your. No, I'm going to be on a plane from Hawaii to here. But that's. I mean, the only thing that normally it's perfectly okay for me to not be at a meeting. The reality is that's our hearing on the budget when we have to vote on the budget. So I think. Okay. You know, and I get it. We announced it. We no, what we vote on the budget is the 14th of March. The 14th of March. So what's on the 20th? It's just a discussion about the budget. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, Mr. Chairman, can I get a motion to adjourn? You may. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.